Good morning. We're going to begin shortly. If you could please take your seats. Good morning. Why don't you come up front? We're going to shut the lights off here in a second, so it'd be great if you could just take a seat. And again, if you're on the ends, if you could potentially just move towards the middle, that would be great. Those that would enter a little bit late, they'd have a place to sit. And there's plenty of room up front, obviously. Though no one wants to sit up there, but there's a lot of space up here, and it's free. Okay, about a 10-second warning, and we're going to shut off the lights for just a couple minutes. digital age, information is power, but what if that power was used to manipulate, deceive, and control? Welcome to the world of information warfare, a modern battleground where truth is often a casualty and your perception is the target. From false narratives to targeted disinformation, Adversaries use sophisticated tactics to spread confusion and create division. These tactics aren't just random, they're strategic. They exploit our emotions, sow distrust, and polarize societies. Understanding how information is used as a weapon is crucial to defend against these attacks. In hybrid warfare, Information is used to achieve an advantage in which our adversaries seek to weaken our society. In the end, the most effective weapon against information warfare is awareness, education, and training. This is why we are here. This is why we are being proactive in this domain. Welcome to Norwich University's Military Writers Symposium. Be manipulated, and all of us are susceptible. The script that you just heard, it's true. Our vision at Norwich is to be a leader in research, education, and understanding in this field. It is true that hybrid and cognitive warfare is in hyperdrive, and many in our society are unaware. It's one thing to tell you about constructing a version of reality, and it's quite the other to have you experience the process. Our societies have just begun the nexus between technology, AI, cognitive computing, and quantum computing. The future can be predicted, but we will be off just as much as those who tried to predict 2024 100 years ago, where in 1924 we were just replacing horses and only 45% of Americans had electricity. Morgan Freeman was not, as some of you suspected, real, but 
How long did it take for you to realize that? The audio and video were created by Cadet Brendan Coyne, who's conducting research in this area, and Dr. Jonathan Atkins, sitting right up front. Dr. Atkins is from NU's Leahy School of Cybersecurity and Advanced Computing, and he created the avatar. My name is Dr. Travis Morris, and I have the honor of being the Executive Director of the Military Writers Symposium and the Peace and War Center Director. I would like to welcome you to this year's symposium, and we are thrilled that you're able to attend. We welcome our distinguished guests from all over the world, and thank you in advance for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Lieutenant General Potter, uh, we are so thankful for you being here, ma'am, and we look forward to hearing your remarks in a few minutes. The Military Writers Symposium exists to advance our understanding of significant security challenges that we face in the 21st century. Our nation's future leaders, who are the students in this room, and the students who are on campus, will see a battlefield that is fought on multiple fronts, both in war and in peacetime. Preparing leaders for the future has been Norwich's business for over 200 years. It's what we do, it's what we will always do. Norwich is currently a thought leader in the information warfare space. We have undergraduate and graduate minors and certificates. We do information warfare simulations, information warfare research and internships, and software applications dedicated to this domain. We and our partners, like Norwich University Applied Research Institute, are proud to be in the lead in understanding this critical subject. Over the next two days, you, our campus, and community have an excellent program before you. We would like to encourage you to attend as many of these sessions as you can, to ask questions, and to interact with our guests. The symposium and the Colby Award would not be possible without the support of the university leadership and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. A heartfelt thanks to Lieutenant General John Broadmeadow, President of Norwich University, Provost and Dean of the Faculty, Brigadier General Gaines, PhD, Associate Provost for Research and Chief Research Officer, Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Leah Williams, Senior Associate Provost, Commandant and Vice President of Student Affairs, Brigadier General McCullough, the Military Writers Associates, Norwich University's development and for their continued support. So this year's theme, Perception Wars, the battle to control reality emphasizes that an information war is happening and it will only accelerate and it impacts absolutely all of us in this room. The next two days will unpack the ingredients of the current informational environment. This morning, we are very fortunate to have Lieutenant General Potter deliver our keynote address and her remarks. Afterwards, we should have some time for question and answer and you'll see two mics that are to your left and to your right. So if you have questions, you can be thinking about that should we have time at the end. And also Chatham House rules apply if you're not certain what that is, just briefly, the information that is shared in this room does not need to be attributed. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Lieutenant General John Broadmeadow, Norwich's 25th president, who is the highest ranking Marine officer to ever graduate. Just a few, few couple remarks, so I got it. This is the highest ranking Marine officer to ever graduate Norwich. He has a very distinguished 37 years of Marine Corps service. He will introduce our keynote speaker, so let's welcome him with a round of applause. Welcome, sir. Hey, hey come here. We'll stand here one second. Um, where's your team? Can I get your team to stand up? I'm going to start with a thank you, and there's probably going to be a lot of these throughout the day, but, but um, you know, like, like many of you know, uh, although I've been around this university uh, since 1979, uh, uh, a lot of things that I'm seeing now as your president are my first. And while I've heard about the Military Writers Symposium and I've heard about our Peace and War Center, um, I really never understood it. Um, what I am learning at a very rapid rate here is that this it truly is uh, a world-class program that we've got here. We really do talk about some cutting-edge things. I had a great opportunity to sit through uh, an information warfare exercise that our students and students from other senior military colleges sat through. Um, and, it, and it really opened my eyes as to how good it was. And in preparing for, for uh, our event this year, I really became to uh, understand that uh, Dr. Morris and his team, where's your team? 
They're probably they're all, they're all out and about. <laughs> so good. So on behalf of all of them, I want to say, uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you for, thank you, for putting this on. And I think a lot of other people are probably going to do that throughout this. Uh, but as the new guy on the block here, I wanted to say thank you, sir. Thank very, you very much for all that you've done, Travis. Thank you. So now this better go off without a hitch, right? So. All right. Um, so now I can skip my whole first paragraph here. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure to have you all here. I'm glad to see uh, a number of these seats uh, filled up, and I know that people will be coming in and out throughout the day. Uh, this is our 30th annual symposium. 30 years of continuous effort and evolution is impressive and something that we should all be very proud of. Our dedicated faculty and staff have spent three decades refining this symposium into a staple event that takes place on our campus every year. It's important that we create a space not only to discuss exceptional military writing, but one where we can learn from high-level professionals in person right here in Northfield. This year we're hosting some experts who are exploring one of the most pressing threats to global peace in history, information warfare. You know, uh, just a, a quick deviation and something I'd like you to keep in mind uh, as we go through this that one of my mentors said, and, and he's pretty famously quoted out there, that the nature of warfare does not change, but the character of warfare continually evolves. And I'd like you to kind of keep that in mind as you go through the conversations over the next couple days. Warfare does constantly evolve and weapons become more potent and more powerful to the point where kinetically the earth could be destroyed in a matter of minutes. But information warfare is dangerous in a very different way. You know, when I was a student here in the early 80s, we were keenly aware of the threat of nuclear war, but the internet was barely even discussed. And the vast cyber networks that we have today didn't even exist. It's quite astonishing how technological advancements, not just traditional weapons, pose some of the greatest threats to our future. It's crucial that we understand the role of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity and their hold on hybrid warfare. What are the consequences of wartime propaganda transforming into everyday attacks on reality? How do we keep our strategic and tactical information safe from our enemies? How do we employ artificial intelligence to ensure our security while others are exploiting it and undermining it? We recognize the importance of keeping abreast of all these changes, but we hold events like this one because we want to be ahead of the curve. 30 years into its existence, this is still the only symposium of, the only symposium of its kind, bringing together some of the brightest minds from field and the classroom. Today, I'm proud to introduce one of those bright minds, our keynote speaker, United States Army Lieutenant General Laura Potter, the 58th Director of the Army Staff. There's hard, hard, hardly a better person we could highlight today. General Potter is commissioned in the Military Intelligence Corps in 1989. She's built an impressive resume throughout the years. She's seen assignments and deployments around the globe, and she's been awarded significant medals to include the Defense Superior Service Medal. Prior to her role as the director of the Army staff, she's held roles as the U.S. Army Deputy Chief of Staff G2, the commanding general at the U.S. Army Intelligence Center of Excellence at Fort Huachuca, and the director J2 of U.S. European Command. What all of those say is that she truly is an expert in this field. Her professional experience is underscored by her commitment to education as she is a distinguished military graduate of Dickinson College, where she studied Russian and Spanish, a graduate of Georgetown's School of Foreign Service, the Center of Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and a graduate of the Naval War College, something I'm very happy to see on your resume, uh, with a master's in national security and strategic studies. We're very lucky to have her with us today, and I'm very proud to be able to do the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Potter. Well, thanks everyone. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here. Um, <clears throat> when I was preparing for these remarks, 
Uh, I noticed that the theme uh, for my remarks was two truths and a lie, and life would be so easy if that's all we had to contend with. But the two truths are one, this topic <clears throat> is absolutely timely and appropriate for this symposium. And the second truth that goes with it is as a career intelligence officer, I do believe this is the greatest threat to our national security and our way of life uh, that we face as a military and as a nation. The lie would be that we're prepared to address it. And there certainly is work being done, but there's a lot more work left to do. And I'm gonna sort of touch on some of my thoughts on that as I close. Um, so as General Broadmeadow mentioned, I'm the 58th director of the Army staff, or as we call it, the DAS. And uh, that job sort of keeps the trains running in the Pentagon. So I don't get out much. So this is a real treat to be able to step away and um, be back on the Norwich campus. I'm truly honored to be sharing this day with some tremendously gifted intellectuals, thinkers, and writers who are very steeped in the theme of the symposium. Um, and I, what I hope to do is to contribute just a little bit based on my observations from 35 years in the Army. Um, before I do that, though, I'd like to begin by thanking Norwich University for all that it has done over the past two centuries to support and defend our nation. It's an absolute privilege to be back here, especially as the university is also celebrating its 50th anniversary of the first women in the Corps of Cadets. You might wonder why I said back on this campus. As some of you know, Norwich University founded a Russian school at Wyndham College in 1958, and the school moved to Norwich 10 years later and grew a reputation for being one of the best Russian immersion programs in the United States during the Cold War. And while the threat that we were most concerned about at the time was the nuclear arsenal and this idea of a bipolar world, understanding what's written in the native language of your adversary was really important to me at the time. In the summer of 1987, I arrived on this campus. The atmosphere, the campus setting, the small town environment created the perfect learning environment for maturing one's language skills. And to this day, I treasure my time here. <clears throat> It's also the birthplace of the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and as a product of ROTC and in, 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 in anticipation of speaking here today, I found myself reflecting on just how impactful that's been to our nation's history. And it was a pretty radical thought at the time, but the efforts of this school's founder, Captain Alden Partridge, have become a cornerstone in our nation's preparedness to meet the many challenges and conflicts it's encountered over the past two plus centuries. His foresight allowed for a wider net to be cast across our citizenry, giving young and energetic and aspiring college students, just like many in this audience, the opportunity to enter into the Army's officer corps. It gave those willing to not just serve, but to lead their fellow countrymen and women a means of commissioning other than attendance at one of our prestigious military academies. This is a legacy that Norwich should always be tremendously proud of. Um, so with that said, for everyone who organized this and for the awesome institution that it represents, I'd like everyone to please give Norwich a round of applause. Okay, now, now I'm going to go on to the topic at hand. And I will tell you, I really struggled with crafting these remarks. And part of the reason I struggled is because I think I could spend five hours talking about this, I could probably spend more. Because as I look back at my career, whether it was my first assignment in Korea, whether it was a deployment to um, Georgia during the Russia-Georgia War that began in 1992, whether it was the Balkans of the 90s, the narratives of both ISIS and Russia during the War on Terror or what we face today, I just have more ideas in my head than we probably have time to share. And as I looked at the bios of the excellent panelists and awardees that you will listen to during the symposium, I also felt like there's a part of me that may not be telling some of you much more than you already know or have observed if you are a savvy and sophisticated consumer of information. So Joan of Arc is known to have said that all battles are first won or lost in the mind. And the idea behind that quote is that a mental state, individual or collective, plays a crucial role in determining the outcome of a battle. 
And at the time it was said, it was likely more about the mental strength, toughness, and courage of individuals and armies to ensure the ensuing physical battle. But if we apply it to today's global security challenges, the battle for the mind, uh, for minds are taking place now in the context of great power competition and in the context of deterrence and in the context of assuring our allies and partners. And our adversaries have more foot soldiers and weapons in this battle than we do. And if we consider the instruments of national power, diplomatic, information, military, and economic, all of which have perception wars woven into them, three of those four, diplomacy, military, and economics, generally have pretty well codified and understood rules of the road. We understand how they're implemented. We understand how our decisions are made to exercise those instruments of national power. However, information is much broader. It's less well-defined, and how we think about that as an instrument of national power has changed during my career. It requires not just a whole-of-government approach, but a whole-of-nation approach. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that conditions for victory in a future conflict state-on-state -state conflict are being established today, not with the emplacement of long-range fire systems, drone swarms, defensive trench lines, or intersecting fields of fire. They're being set through a continuous campaign of information dominance, access, and influence with adversaries who do not share our values or respect our way of life. And as I know all of you know, we're all being influenced right now every day. Citizens across the globe are on some type of electronic device that is feeding information from countless plat platforms through myriad applications augmented with algorithms, machine learning, avatars, deep fakes. And it's a continuous feedback loop that informs data brokers and establishes fundamental biases in how we approach our thinking. They influence our perceptions of the world and they influence our perceptions of state and local environments that we are living in. They influence our attitudes, and they are nudging every one of us in one direction or another on everything from what type of shoes to buy to the pros and cons of a separatist movement in some country across the globe to who is on the right and just side of a war. And I think we're well past the ability of being able to reverse or avoid this because of the profits it generates. For a business, that's profits of being a data broker. For an adversary, it's the profit of being able to destroy or stabilize, destabilize a successful or democratic nation. So with that, we all must be very cognizant of the implications this has for us as private citizens and the implications it has for our national defense. And as most of you know, um, we orient our military strategy based on the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. And the national defense strategy that was written early in this administration um, establishes China as a pacing challenge, Russia as an acute threat, and acknowledges the threats we face from Iran, North Korea, and the continued persistence of violent extremist organizations. I could talk about any one of those state or non-state actors that contest us in the information space, but based on my background and years of experience in Europe, I'm going to focus on Russia, and then I'll be happy to take questions later if you want to talk about something else. Russia is perhaps the most adept in its state-sponsored campaign to control the truth, the narrative, and the reality to, to achieve both political and military aims. They have a long-standing tradition of information confrontation, obfuscation or maskarovka, active measures, manipulation, and in fact, it's part of their written national security policy and their military doctrine. Information warfare is at the forefront of their statecraft and their military planning. They blur the lines between official government communication, their intelligence services, law enforcement, the armed forces, and they condone and or support 
proxies, private military companies, and criminal networks to all be active in this space. Russia uses a wide variety of media to deploy and then volumize their narratives. Social media, traditional print and online media, television such as Russia Today aired globally in eight languages, books, and quite frankly, people on the ground fomenting disagreement and protest. I recall when I was the US European Command J2 and there was a significant threat from the separatist movement in Catalonia, Spain. The intelligence leaders of that country sharing with me the extent to which Russia played a hand in that. My colleagues in Denmark, very concerned about the extent to which Russia and to a lesser extent China are fomenting discord in Greenland and certainly concerns that our colleagues in the United Kingdom prior to Brexit and now looking at the cohesion of the United Kingdom have when it comes to Russia's role in their domestic issues. And as an intelligence officer in the US Army, I don't study this landscape in the United States of America, uh, but you can imagine, um, and those of you that do study it, uh, you can imagine that uh, what they're able to do abroad, they're certainly able to do inside our shores, given the lack of boundaries in the information space. Uh, social and online media uh, obviously is uh, the most growing and pervasive medium that Russia uses, and it's made even more challenging by advances in technology, to include a few I've mentioned, um, the development of sophisticated algorithms, uh, deep fakes, avatars, the dark web, etc. Content is generally high quality. Um, in every capital I traveled to um, when I lived in Europe for five years straight, um, I would flip on RT um, when I got to my hotel room, listen to it in Russian, then I'd flip over and listen to it in Spanish, perhaps, or English. And it's very, very high quality. And of really interesting significance, it's partially true. And sometimes that part true is 10% part true, and sometimes it's like 80 to 90% part true. And the false part is the piercing weapon that hits the center of the target. That partial truth makes the weapon hard to discern if you are not a savvy and sophisticated consumer of information. It's also tailored. It's tailored from a global perspective, if that is the appropriate narrative, as it was, for example, during COVID. It's tailored for a regional narrative, as it might be in the Balkans or in the Russia-Ukraine war right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it's tailored down to micro-narratives. A micro-narrative might be something going on in the Republic of Georgia relative to South Ossetia. Um, a micro-narrative might be the Catalonia example that I gave you. And while one might argue that democracies have the same mediums to deliver the truth or counter a false narrative, in my observation, we don't have a system in place to recognize the false narrative, including its, its depth and breadth, nor do we have the ability to respond in a dynamic and a persistent way. And by dynamic and persistent, I mean if the lie and the truth were both runners, the lie is running an international or global ultramarathon, and the truth is on the ground, putting its running shoes on, getting ready for a regional or a domestic 50-yard dash. So Russia plays a short game, they play a sharp game, and they play a long game. In 1995 in Georgia, I was, a, I was a United Nations military observer living on the Abkhaz side of the Russian-Georgian um, conflict. Um, and I witnessed firsthand Russia's ability during that war and in the immediate aftermath of that war to convince nations around the globe that Georgia's post-Soviet president, Zviad Gamsakhordia's slogan of Georgia for the Georgians was juxtaposed not against Russians, it was juxtaposed against the ethnicities inside Russia's border. And Russia took advantage of that narrative to convince itself and a few of its um, neighbors that the Abkhaz people needed to be freed. 
and in fact that it was a justified war. So the Abkhaz population is about 1.7% of the Georgian territory. And when that war turned into a ceasefire, Russia had successfully achieved a 17% occupation of Georgian territory. And then ironically, the Russians were the peacekeepers keeping the peace. And when I explain this peacekeeping example, um, I use an example of if we could imagine that North Carolina and South Carolina were at war with one another. And the North Carolina peacekeepers that were there to make sure rules and reg regulations were followed were from Camp Liberty, North Carolina. And the South Carolina peacekeepers were from Fort Cavazos, Texas. Well, that was the situation in Georgia. A local Russian airborne unit that lived in Abkhazia, married Abkhaz women, had property in Abkhazia, were in charge of keeping the rules on that side of the border. And needless to say, any atrocities or misbehavior um, done by the Russians went unnoticed and undocumented. On the Georgian side of the border, every step the Georgians took, if they went out of line once, was documented to the United Nations. And not only was that a problem for the UN mission, but it was a problem for how Russia portrayed the Georgian government and the status of that country um, in its information narrative. Uh, many years later, I was the senior intelligence officer in U.S. Army Europe during the first Russia-Ukraine war. And the stories of no Russian troops, and then little green men, and eventually Russian-led separatist forces are now well known. But they were so effective at the time that even a year into that war, some of my most senior counterparts in very um, mature... NATO nations, and by mature I mean steeped militaries, um, actually questioned whether the Russians were in Donetsk and Luhansk. And I used to say to them, you know, separatists cannot build artillery shells in their basement, and separatists cannot fix armored fighting vehicles in their garage. But the narrative coming out of Russia of who was doing what inside Donetsk and Luhansk was so pervasive that even men and women who were my colleagues that had spent decades in the military actually questioned whether the Russians were in Luhansk and Donetsk. And when Russia was asked in 2015, this was one of my favorite experiences actually, when Russia was asked in 2015 to address the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, a 58-nation organization headquartered in Vienna, Austria. Um, I had the opportunity to sit in that forum with my commander, the commander of US Army Europe at the time. And the French delegation spoke first, and then the American delegation spoke, and both delegations very articulately laid out the case for why this was an illegal invasion and an illegal annexation and all of the um, things that Russia had done that were counter to international law and in fact rose to the level of war crimes. The audience was gripped with these two delegations presentations. And I would look around the room and notice that you, you could hear a pin drop. So the third delegate to speak was the Russian delegation. And the witness uh, sat down, uh, took out his notes. And there was a screen like this behind the delegation. And all of a sudden, a slideshow came up. And the slideshow was a rolling slideshow of the most beautiful art done by Russian artists in the history of the nation. And for those of you who are connoisseurs of Russian art, they have some of the most beautiful art in the world. So I looked around at the very same audience who during the first two presentations was gripped with what the speakers were saying and they were all looking at the art. And they weren't paying attention to what the delegate was actually saying as he carefully walked through the reasons why in the eyes of President Putin and the Russian leadership, the war was in fact just based on Russia, based on NATO not being a defensive alliance but its expansion posing a direct threat to Russia's national security. It was truly a remarkable presentation. 
In the second Russia-Ukraine war, Russia has continued to refine the aspects of the perception, both uh, domestically and across the globe, that have given them some advantages in battle. So for example, when there's a Ukrainian deep strike inside Crimea, Russia often posts on social media ahead of the Ukrainians or any local um, onlooker that everything was shot down before the strike was even completed so that they can get their message out before the Ukrainians can. And as many of you know, the first message is often the winning message because all the subsequent messages have to fight back um, to counter that narrative. Um, they also have made false accusations against the Ukrainians of war crimes. They've made false accusations of body counts backed up with manufactured evidence, um, and the list goes on. These type of tax tactics should concern us on two fronts. First, they significantly increase the fog and friction of war. And second, they have the potential to slow down our decision making and thus increase risk to both the mission and the force. And second, if believed, they have the potential to erode will. Will of a fighting force, will of a nation, will or cohesion of an alliance will of citizen, citizenries that don't actually know what the ground truth really is. The ChemBio narrative is also something that should concern us. And while I have used tactical examples heretofore, I think the ChemBio narrative is something we should study and we should appreciate. It's probably the most significant example of the long game um, that, um, is, is potentially very threatening. So for decades, the Soviet Union and then Russia has accused the United States of developing biological weapons to sow fear, to create mistrust, and to divert attention from other Russian misbehavior. These false narratives date back to the Korean War, um, to genetic engineering of HIV in the 1980s, to migratory birds and bats designed to threaten Russians in the midst of this current Russia-Ukraine war. These examples are a snapshot of Russia's multi-decade long game to, to reverse post-Soviet losses, to erode NATO cohesion, and to discredit European democracies. So I think it's important, and, and I could give hundreds of examples, so I had to sort of cut off my examples at some point, but I think it's really important that part of this symposium thinks about what we should do about this. So I penned out a few things, um, some military, some not. So first is a whole of education, a whole of nation education on, on this type of threat and how to be a sophisticated consumer of information. And I'm very proud of what Norwich University has done in this area with the information warfare area of concentration. Um, but, you know, I have a senior in high school, and we're, we live in Arlington, Virginia. It's known to be a pretty good school district. And so I was getting ready for these remarks, and I asked my high school senior, at any time in high school, has anyone, your government teacher, your history teacher, your social studies teacher, has anyone actually talk to you about what this threat is like? Has anyone talked to you about how you should consume information and the threats of you consuming mis or disinformation? And he literally said, Mom, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, you know, because he's the son of a career intel officer, he has to suffer through reading real, like, foundational works that are cited and, you know, that are backed up and you can sort of verify the truth on. But I imagine the vast majority of his friends don't. And so as laudatory as it is that a place like this has an area of concentration, it is far too late. It's an alarm bell that I think really needs to be sounded to our Department of Education. When I know there's some people in here whose hair is just as gray as mine, so you probably remember in your childhood, even at a very young, impressionable age, being educated on the nuclear threat. You probably had to do a drill in school about it. And we are raising a generation of children who do not know how to protect themselves from false narratives. 
So that whole of nation education is to me the first and a very important step. We also have to enhance our use of technology. So we talk about the development of AI and machine learning, but we also have to continue to develop technology that can detect um, false narratives, that can verify the truth, that can catalog bad actors. You know, if you have um, a very purposeful lie done by um, a, a ecosystem of people, whether it's trolls inside a nation state or whether it's a machine-enabled volumizing of information, we need to have the technology in place that can um, blunt the effects of that. And within the Army, uh, we have worked very hard to develop doctrine. Um, we've established um, the parameters of information advantage, um, and we have developed forces inside the Army. So Army Cyber Command um, has responsibility for um, understanding what's going on in this space, both the technical threat vectors through a cyber-enabled operation and what is going on in the um, influence area. And then we've also developed teams at our theater armies called Theater Information Advantage Detachments, and their job is to be able to assist those theater commanders in assessing what is going on in the information environment. The last thing I would say in a military context is the narratives associated with state or non-state actors that intend, intend to do us harm in a military context have to be thought of using some of the same doctrinal terms we use in a physical war. So we have to think about it as an attack, an ambush. We have to realize that they are maneuvering in the information space. And one very important aspect in a military operation of analyzing this is being able to do what we call battle damage assessment. In a kinetic strike, battle damage assessment is relatively easy. You bomb a building and you can see the effects with the human eye. You can send something to look at the effects. You can send a person to look at the effects. In the information space, the battle the dam damage assessment is much, much harder, and that's gonna require a different level of analysis, and it will also need to be aided by technology. So to understand, you know, in the, in the first Russia-Ukraine war, the Russians accused a German battalion commander who was in NATO's enhanced forward presence in Lithuania of being a Nazi, and they accused an American of committing a sexual assault on a Ukrainian woman in Kyiv. Those can have very strategic effects if you think of the reaction in Germany to that or fear the Lithuanians might have given the history that um, they endured in the last century. So how to understand what was the impact of that message and what do we as a military need to do about it beyond a tweet or a public affairs statement or an acknowledgement in a declarative way that that, that 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 wasn't true. So I'm gonna wrap it up there by saying from a strategic long game level to anything that would help us um, deter um, adversaries in the future, shore up the cohesion we have with our allies and partners and be prepared for this should we ever go to conflict are extremely important. So I commend to all of you to think in this space, to write in this space, and to teach and coach those coming up behind you in this space, that it's really critical that we move out with a whole nation approach. And with that, I wanna thank you for your time, and I stand ready for your questions. So at this time, if you have any questions, please move to both, both mics. And while I know there's questions in the audience, there's a bunch of bright students that have focused on IW for, for a while. So while that's happening, ma'am, may I just start us off with a question. Thinking back to 9-11, there were many in the intel community, many in the DOD that were talking about terrorism. But it took an event like 9-11 for us to pivot. There are those that are talking about, and this 
like yourself, ma'am, that's why we're glad you're here, about how important this topic is. Do you think that it will take a significant IW event here in the state, much like those in Europe or other countries have experienced, for us to actually recognize at a whole of government level the importance of this, this threat? Um, I don't know if it could or would be one significant event. I think the, the cumulative nature, like, you know, if there was a significant chem bio incident, because I use that as my last example, if there was a significant event somewhere in the world, um, you know, I think back to the um, Screepall assassination attempt in the United Kingdom. I was, about two months after that assassination attempt, I was in line at the, um, you know, to go through where you show your pa passport control. And I was standing next to a relatively senior diplomat, and he just, we struck up a conversation, and he said, it's a really a shame that, you know, some of that toxic agent might have come from that, the labs here in the UK. And I was flabbergasted. Like, are you kidding me? Flabbergasted. So we have these, it's like your, you know, your heartbeat on your EKG. We have these points in time where we're seized with how terrible that is. But to me, it's very hard for it to have a 9-11 type effect. We, it, it does on the cyber and high-end tech intrusion kind of things, but on the narrative side, it's very hard for us to do this. And I think if you look at like the growth of the Global Engagement Center in the State Department and some of the things we've done over the last several years, there is knowledge in every one of our departments of the government that it's a problem. I just don't think we're organized and I don't think we have a collective knot in our stomach about the need to not run the 50 yard dash. You know, that we've gotta have marathon runners. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Cadet Berg. Uh, I'm a biochemistry major. My question today was, you mentioned that state uh, organizations have an advantage in the IW space. Do you think that we model our own IW preparation after Russia, and do you think that we should? So, I mean, obviously, there's a huge difference in terms of our values, and, you know, Russia has no concern about putting forth lies and false narratives and disinformation. So, our values ground us in that, and that, that'll always be a difference. Um, and we can never lose sight of that. Um, in terms of organization, Russia and China and others have just applied more human beings to this. I mean, they have thousands and thousands of people working on this. And uh, I don't know if we have a whole of government level of ambition to do that, but as I mentioned, they've got more foot soldiers at it than we do. But we do have ways to, to expand some of our information warfare um, tactics in a, in a fight. We just can't lose sight of in the active campaigning space that we're in, we gotta stay wedded to the truth and to our values. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, this side. Good morning, ma'am. My name's Chandler Bullinger. <clears throat> I study cybersecurity. I'm a senior here at Norwich University. Um, I have a question. It's probably a weird one. Um, and this is more of my personal experience. Um, I meet people throughout the United States um, from the East Coast, West Coast, here at Norwich University in the military. Um, how you say you talk about education being very important with cybersecurity, um, just in our recognizing our threats that we have. Um, what do you tell those people that don't really care? And there's people sometimes here at Norwich University not calling Norwich University out. It's just people who are not fully aware of the threat with China and Russia. Um, they will download TikTok, or they will they will click those links. They don't really care what they're reading. Um, what type of what what should we? As we are aware, we probably are aware of the threat here. But what about those people that don't? What's the message we should be trying to convince them that hey, this is a real issue? You know, there are people consistently outside the United States that want to hurt us, yeah. and saying that straightforward to them probably isn't going to work. They're like, oh, that's not real. And yeah. so I have a question for you. What what do you think? on that, and that's kind of my experience I've seen it, because there's a lot of people that don't care, so thank you. Well, um, you know, I think, first of all, ha when, when we come upon examples that we know are not only false narratives, but are potentially destructive, calling them out to our colleagues, like just educating people on whether they realize that what they're seeing is mis and disinformation, and more importantly, whether they understand 
the objectives of that adversary. So I sort of describe Russia's objective in the information space as destructive. It wants to destruct or disturb or disarray what's going on inside a country. Stra China's is a little more strategically outcompete, but they both have a national objective that runs counter to the West, and we need to educate our colleagues on that when we see it. I don't think we're ever going to get away from local self-interest, <laughs> like we read what we want to read, we buy what we want to buy, but we have to educate ourselves on what's behind that. Thank you, ma'am. So unfortunately, we are out of time. However, we do appreciate the questions that you have. Perhaps you could stay around. We have some experts that you could ask, and perhaps the general may be able to entertain just a couple questions. But let's give Lieutenant General Potter a round of applause. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I was really honored uh, to be able to be the keynote for such an important topic. And um, I hope you all continue to think and write about it, because I do think it's critical to our national security. And for any of you who had a question but didn't get a chance to ask it, uh, my aide, Major Steve Orban's in the room. He's got my business cards. The staff here knows how to reach me, because um, this is a dialogue we got to continue to have with our most young people in the audience and the most senior experts that are thinking and writing on this. Thanks very much. Thank you, ma'am. And we look forward to seeing everyone at our next event at 10 o'clock. The program's on the outside. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. We're going to start this sh next panel shortly in about a minute. Probably good now. And also, good morning. I am uh, also a senior studying political science. My name is James Culp. Uh, in 2025, in the spring, I'm going to be commissioning as a naval aviator. And today, James and I are here with Ms. Nina Jacquez. Ms. Nina Jacquez is an internationally recognized expert on business and management. She has received awards from the Department of Transportation and Logistics and the Office of Transportation and Logistics. In 2022, Jankowitz was appointed to lead the Disinformation Governments Board, an intra-agency best practices and coordination entity at the Department of Homeland Security. She resigned the position after a sustained dis disinformation campaign caused by the Biden administration to abandon the project. From 2017 to 2022, Jankowitz also held fellowships at the Wilson Center, where she led accessible, actionable research about the efforts of disinformation on women, on women and freedom of expression around the world. She advised the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on strategic communications under the support of Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship in 2016 to 2017. Early in her career, she managed democracy assistance programs in Russia and Belarus at the National Democratic Institute. For audience members, Ms. Jane, after the presentation, Sophie and I will pose a couple of questions after the conversation. We'll open it up to you all and the microphones on the left and the right. Uh, please pose questions for her. Ms. Jankowitz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, James. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for having me here today. It's really a delight to be here. Um, on a personal note, it's also special for me to be here today. My, my dad was uh, an aerial reconnaissance officer in Vietnam, and uh, today is 14 years since he passed away as a result of his exposure to Agent Orange, which made him develop uh, multiple myeloma. So I know he'd be proud for me to be here today. I've, uh, I've always been very happy um, and honored to engage with our military at various levels at the National War College in DC and uh, testifying before the House Armed Services Committee. And this is yet another, uh, another thing that I'm proud to engage with. So thanks again for having me. Um, so just a little bit about myself. The, the students have introduced me, but uh, a little bit more color for you. Um, I've done a lot of different things in my career. And on the drive over here, uh, one of the cadets was asking me, you know, what, what can I do to make my career a little bit look like yours? Uh, and my, my response was, don't say no to things, right? Uh, keep your, your experiences, your eyes open. Um, try to be open to new experiences. And you don't know where life is going to take you. Uh, I started my career working on democracy assistance programs to Russia and Belarus. I actually went to the same graduate school uh, that the 
Lieutenant General did at Georgetown, the School of Foreign Service, and studied Russian and East European studies there, and found myself uh, administering programs to Russia and Belarus at a time when democracy assistance to Central and Eastern Europe wasn't something that was really on vogue. I actually had a lot of my classmates tell me, well, Russia, Russia's not a threat anymore. It's not the Cold War in, anymore. Why are you studying this? Why are you working on this? And that year that I was graduating was actually the year that uh, Russia kind of asked USAID, the US Agency for International Development, to leave Russia. And we started to see this steep decline in US-Russian relations that has kind of led us to where we are today. So uh, joke's on them. Um, but uh, from there, I, I went and I, I did a Fulbright in Ukraine. I was very happy to be advising the Ukrainian foreign ministry in what was then the third year of a war that's now been going on for more than 10. Uh, and at that time, there was already Ukraine fatigue happening among the international community. My colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were, were fighting Russian disinformation every day on the ground. And at the same time, we saw the United States kind of waking up to the threat of Russian information warfare after our 2016 election. Uh, I've worked in nonprofits, in, in the government, in the tech spheres. I've spent time across the region. And now I lead a new nonprofit, and my bio was not up to date, so that's on me, uh, that is focused on exposing deceptive inter information practices here in the United States, whether they're coming from foreign or domestic sources. And so, with that in mind, I thought today I would give you a little bit of an information roadmap of where we've been, where we are, where we're going, and, and how we got to where we are today. So uh, Sophia and James told me that uh, you guys would appreciate a, a GIF. Oop, I've got to use the clicker here. Maybe. Have I messed something up now? I think I ruined everything. It's not advancing. Uh, let me see. Resume slideshow. Let's see if that does it. There we go. There's the GIF. All right, a cat. Um, why am I showing you a picture of a cat? It is because, in my opinion, and the Lieutenant General alluded to this, we have, uh, this, is, this is basically what the US response to information warfare has looked like. We have been playing whack-a-troll for the past eight years. We've been trying to remove content from the internet. We've been trying to suppress certain content. We want to point out what's Russian trolls and what's not, right? It's not a very effective or joined up response. And I think we need to move not only toward a whole of government response, but a whole of society response. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about today. As I said, these are the questions that I hope to answer for you. And I thought we'd start just by setting some ground definitions, because I hear still to this day uh, you know, preeminent journalists, members of Congress, even sometimes uh, heads of state misusing these terms. So let's talk about what they are. Disinformation, the way I define it, and I think the agreed upon definition for uh, most scholars, is false or misleading information that's shared with malign intent, right? That's our adversaries using false information to undermine our democracies. That is folks who are hawking miracle cures on the internet uh, or, or selling kind of faulty goods. Um, the folks who are engaging in clickbait, they're also engaging in disinformation, right? But that's different than misinformation. And here we are in uh, October. Next month is Thanksgiving. We're all going to be returning home to our families, hopefully avoiding some of the sticky political conversations that we hope to avoid. But we've all got that one relative, right, who loves to traffic in conspiracy theories, Crazy Aunt Sally or Uncle Bob. And that's misinformation. They're not necessarily doing that with any malign intent. They just want to share what they've seen or read on the internet because they think it might be interesting to you or helpful to you. They're not trying to take over the world or anything like that. And that's a bit different than propaganda. Propaganda is false or misleading information that has a political purpose behind it, um, that is advancing a particular political worldview. A little bit different than disinformation. Uh, if we look at some of the campaigns that we've already heard about today, Russia has often been on both sides of the same issue. It's not necessarily always pushing the Russian worldview or saying Russia is great. Uh, conversely, we've got China that engages in propaganda quite deliberately. Uh, if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, China was pushing a very pro-China narrative at that time, sending PPE, sending ventilators, et cetera. Um, that, that falls under the idea of propaganda. What Russia's doing today is rarely propaganda. Sometimes it is, but it's mostly disinformation. 
So back in 2016, uh, we are all familiar with, with what happened, so I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail, but I am going to highlight a couple of things that are important. You know, during the presidential, vice presidential debate a couple of days ago, we heard uh, vice presidential candidate Vance, Senator Vance, mention uh, Russian ads. Uh, Russia bought five, uh, not $500,000, as he said, but $100,000 in ads on Facebook. This was the big story back then, right? Russia's buying ads and rubles. How could Facebook allow this to happen? Uh, if you look at that ad archive, which I encourage you to do, and I have my graduate students do at Syracuse, uh, you can see that most of those ads weren't particularly effective. And so you might hear people say, well, Russian disinformation in 2016 actually wasn't effective. But what was effective was the hack and leak operation that happened. Uh, if you don't know, or if you were perhaps in middle school at that time, as some of the younger folks among the audience might have been, uh, what happened was the, the Democratic campaign was hacked by Russian intelligence services, who then leaked private documents to the, for the world to see. And they did this during the month of October, the October surprise, right? That was much more effective than any Russian ad that the government could have bought because it changed how the candidates talked about each other, it changed how the media, media talked about the campaigns, and it changed what was uh, going on in voters' heads as they headed toward the, the voting booth in November. Now, can we say definitively that Russian disinformation changed votes? No, but we can say that it changed the discourse, and I think that's very important. And I think anybody who cares about our democratic infrastructure, about about elections should be really worried that uh, still to this day we've got Russian, Chinese, Iranian hackers attempting to hack the campaigns, leak documents, embarrass candidates, embarrass campaigns. That should be the domain of the American media and American voters only. So that's one thing that was going on. We also saw an embrace of domestic disinformation, mostly coming from, at that time, candidate Trump. I don't have to go through uh, what, was, what was going on back then. Uh, we've seen some of it since then. We've seen the undermining of our electoral processes as well. But I would say, far from you know, typical politicians, uh, perhaps twisting statistics, omitting context, we had a deliberate engagement with lies that we had never had before. And this is important, particularly in in the context of Russian disinformation, because Russia is not often making things up whole cloth. They are seizing on fissures in our society, pre-existing fissures, that they can amplify and push forward in order to under undermine our democracies. I also want to note there were disinformation for profit operations going on. So there was a little town, there still is a little town called Velesh in Macedonia, where a bunch of teenagers figured out if they created clickbait articles about Hillary Clinton, denigrating her, you know, talking about how she was horrible, trafficking in rumors, what have you, and then monetized that site with Google Ads, they could make lots and lots of money. And indeed, they did. They made over a million dollars and were driving around their little uh, town in Mercedes Benzes. Uh, this industry has exploded since 2016. There are no real uh, checks or balances or regulations on what people can say on the internet and then monetize with services like Google Ads. And uh, this is another kind of darker side. It's not a nation state that's engaging in this behavior, but there are people who are just trying to you know, separate us, to divide us for money, for monetary gain. Nope, okay. Something is happening here. I'll sing for you while we figure it out. Uh, it appears to be frozen, tech folks. So I'm not sure. Resume slideshow again. Let's see what's going on. And nope, still cannot advance. I will continue without the slides. Um, now, what the difference between what was going on in 2016 and what's happening now in 2020 is that we have a diversity of actors. I will move aside and keep talking here. Um, we have a diversity of actors. Where Russia was the primary uh, foreign entity on the scene back then, we now have Iran participating, just a hack and leak recently, uh, targeting the Trump campaign that was quite widely reported on. Um, we've heard about Spamiflage Dragon, which is one of the Chinese operations putting out disinformation. Uh, there's, there's those big three. But then we've also got, thank you, 
There we go. Um, we've got savvier foreign actors. We've got domestic political extremists. We've got disinformation for profit that has exploded, as I've just mentioned. But we also have a diversity of platforms. It's not just about Twitter and Facebook anymore. Uh, in fact, because of Elon Musk taking over Twitter, we now have folks who are really spread out around the internet, not on Twitter necessarily anymore. In 2016, TikTok didn't exist. Uh, we've got folks on TikTok and disinformation being driven there, claims that the Chinese government uh, is able to affect what we are seeing on our feeds because they own that proprietary technology and are pushing different things out through the algorithm there. And we've also got a diversity of tactics. It's not just about ads and hack and leaks anymore. We're seeing information laundering when uh, individuals introduce narratives to domestic entities. We actually have seen this a lot with Ukraine fatigue where uh, members of Congress mention uh, certain grievances that only, only the Russian government has brought up in Ukraine and suddenly they're being aired in the halls of Congress like the language rights of Hungarians in Transcarpathia. This was something that members of Congress brought up uh, in order to undermine Ukraine aid recently. And we're seeing, of course, artificial intelligence powered disinfo and closed groups. So channels, uh, platforms like Telegram, Facebook groups, other closed entities where people can exchange information it's a trusted community. There's not a lot of visibility into what's going on there. We're seeing foreign actors as well as domestic actors engaging in that sort of disinformation in those groups. And we don't have a ton of visibility there. Now, we got here through kind of a murky situation, and some of this was alluded to in the wonderful video we saw opening the conference. Uh, unfortunately, from 2016 onward, the idea of Russian interference has been politicized. We have seen an acute reaction from both sides of the political spectrum. On, on the right, uh, we've seen the, the kind of undermining that this even happened. Um, believe me, if I mention Russia among certain groups in Washington, D.C., I will be shouted out of the room because they don't want to talk about the fact that Russia was and continues to interfere in our political processes for foreign policy gain. But we also saw perhaps an overcorrection from the left who were eager to blame Hillary Clinton's 2016 loss entirely on Russia. And I think there were a lot of factors that went into that. And we don't need to litigate that today. But as a result, this issue has become extremely politicized. COVID really entrenched that. We saw widespread false narratives, mistrust, conspiracy theories that people were leaning on because it was a confusing and scary time and conspiracy theories offer a, a way for people to navigate today's information environment uh, that is simpler, right? That, that uh, provides them community, that provides an explanation for things that are difficult that we're all dealing with. And then from 2020 to today, of course, we had the Stop the Steal movement, this normalization of disinformation and distrust in the government, claiming that our political processes, our infrastructure uh, of democracy is not safe anymore. When we've heard our intelligence, agency, uh, intelligence agencies, our cybersecurity and infrastructure security agencies say that the elections that we've held since 2016 have been progressively more and more secure right? Uh, we know that foreign entities are trying to affect the vote. They're not able to do that. They are certainly engaging in information warfare and influence operations, uh, and we are doing our best to dispel those things. But to say that our vote is not secure uh, is, is something that, uh, unfortunately, uh, plays into the hand of those that want to weaponize pre-existing fissures for their benefit. This is a, a report that comes out every two years from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that I encourage you all to read. Um, it is a bulletin about election threats that have been ongoing. And there's been one, I think, every year since 20, every uh, biannually since 2018. Um, this is a really interesting document, came out at the end of last year, that was looking at our midterm elections in 2022. And again, that diversity of actors is something I want you to remember. So uh, what it says is that China attempted to influence a handful of midterm races across political parties where it deemed that uh, a certain outcome might be positive for U.S.-China relations or U.S.-China policy. 
Iran continued to attempt to exploit social divisions and undermine confidence in our democratic institutions. You might remember in 2020, Iran targeted democratic voters in a handful of swing states, um, pretending to be uh, individuals from the Proud Boys, the militia group, saying that they would be intimidated at the polls if they went out to vote. That operation was very roundly dismissed by the IC, DHS, uh, and the FBI in 2020 um, in a coordinated effort that I'll get back to later. But Iran continues to do this sort of stuff and did it in the 2022 elections. Russia was very specifically attempting to undermine the Democratic Party and especially confidence uh, in the election in order to undermine support for Ukraine. So again, 2022, our midterms happened just a few months after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and that campaign to undermine confidence in Ukraine aid, undermine support for Ukraine, continues today. And what's very interesting to me, although it's redacted across the report, is that the IC assessed that Cuba and other smaller nations were also learning from the playbook that the Russians and others had put forward before them. So we've got uh, a, a real diversity of actors as we head toward 2024. Uh, now, we are just less than 30 days before the election, and here's what we've got going on already from the key uh, axis of foreign interference campaigns. We have Russia, which has engaged in the doppelganger operation. Have any of you heard of doppelganger? One person. All right, let me explain for you. Way to go. Uh, so Doppelganger is an ongoing years-long operation that Russia has engaged in in order to mimic real news sites in our, uh, our country. So it might be a site that looks exactly like the Washington Post, for instance, but instead of WashingtonPost.com, it'll be WashingtonPost.co, and when someone navigates there, they get a site that, again, really looks like the Washington Post, but actually... Uh, when you look at the content, sometimes is AI-generated content, it's very divisive content, it puts forward a Russian worldview or uh, undermines kind of support for key concepts, key initiatives like Ukraine aid, for instance. Um, there have been a number of takedowns that the Department of Justice has done. They've seized uh, domains that have been bought using uh, web servers here in the United States. They're, they're stationed there. Um, they've been able to undermine that operation, but it continues, right? Again, playing whack a troll in a little bit of a, a way. Um, we have the copy cop operation, which is another interesting one. A former sheriff from Florida sought asylum in Russia, and he uh, seems to be now working hand in hand, if not directly for the Russian government, in order to, again, populate sites that look like local news sites. So rather than the Washington Post, it might be the Northfield Times or something like that. You might stumble upon it using a Facebook ad or a search. And again, what you find there is often AI-generated content. He's using chatbots like ChatGPT to populate news articles that are compelling, salacious, divisive, uh, and meant to divide people. There was also an AI-enhanced bot farm that RT was using, Russia Today, the Russian propaganda network, in order to push Russian narratives on social media. This is a bit different from the bots of yesteryear because rather than just a Twitter egg and a string of letters and numbers, what we have is real seeming accounts that have an AI-generated avatar, uh, they've got a real name, they've got an identity because you can engage with ChatGPT or other LLMs this way to create these identities, and they use uh, AI in order to pump out content on different schedules, so an AI-enhanced bot farm. And then most recently, uh, just a few weeks ago as a matter of fact, we had a huge uh, indictment come down from the DOJ saying that uh, RT had paid $10 million to a company called Tenet Media out of Tennessee, which was set up expressly to funnel that money to a bunch of conservative YouTubers who were spreading divisive content online. Now, there was no direct, it seems like there was no direct editorial connection between RT and those YouTubers, but Russia wanted to invest in the content that they were making to continue to push divisions in our society. It's a pretty shocking, uh, shocking turn of events, and $10 million is a far cry from the $100,000 in ads that Russia purchased back in 2016. I've already mentioned Iran 
Hans Hackenleek of the Trump campaign, uh, also an attempted hack of the Harris and previously Biden campaigns. Um, the idea there is the same as what Russia engaged in in 2016, try to identify uh, you know, embarrassing documents that they might share with, uh, with media organizations. So far, our media has been quite circumspect, and many journalists have passed on publishing these documents because it has been widely reported that they're coming from Iran. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting development. And then uh, China, we've seen a number of things. I mentioned Spamouflage Dragon. Again, that's a wide, uh, widespread bot network that's engaged in a number of democracies. But we also see in that network and others troll accounts that are impersonating Trump supporters uh, in order, again, to give the guise of grassroots to support to some of the divisive narratives that these countries are interested in. Now. Uh, in, back in 2020, I wrote a paper for Parameters, the uh, U.S. Army War College's uh, journal, which you can all look at, called Enduring Information Vigilance, uh, How to Respond to Disinformation After COVID-19. And I wrote this with a colleague of mine who is a uh, U.K. Army Reserve officer um, looking at kind of the transatlantic response to disinformation and what we needed to do to wake up to the persistent threat that we were at that moment experiencing in 2020. And I encourage you to read the paper, it's not too dense, um, but I'll give you the top lines here for a second. We assessed that nations like China, Russia, and Iran are engaged in what we called perpetual information competition. And you heard this from the Lieutenant General earlier today. These hostile states are engaged in this competition because they recognize it's the new normal. Uh, there is very low cost to entry and high reward if they get it right, right? They're constantly probing for new vulnerabilities in our societies, whether those are issues around race, gun control, abortion, et cetera. Um, I will note that once uh, Vice President Harris entered the, the race for president, immediately Russia went after her with gendered and racist rhetoric. So again, another, another vulnerability they were probing. They are using all channels, channels available to them, not government and non-government, online and offline, in order to influence our societies. Uh, they are not concerned about whether something is the portfolio of one department and they're going to be stepping on toes and turf. No, they just go for it. They throw spaghetti at the wall and they see what sticks. Uh, this doesn't in adhere neatly to our international boundaries. I think we still... Um, try to think about information warfare as something that, okay, it's happening over there, and I know this is a particular challenge, right, for the military because uh, your domain is, is abroad, not here at home, but we need to think of this as uh, understanding that Russia, Iran, China, others aren't, you know, looking neatly at the, the difference between domestic and uh, foreign disinformation, and in fact are exploiting that. So understanding what perpetual information competition looks like for our adversaries, my colleague and I uh, came up with this concept of enduring information vigilance. So what do we need to do, not only in the military, but in our whole of government response to disinformation uh, in order to meet this challenge? First of all, we need to improve our capabilities. And this is one of the things that you're all doing here today at this conference and in your studies at Norwich. Uh, this is important to invest in the building of an understanding that this is an enduring threat beyond discrete campaigns. We're often finding ourselves on the back foot reacting to adversarial information warfare. We need to advance awareness and understanding of these campaigns and also the tools, right? Um, and I know you're all doing that here, so you, you're off to a great start. We need to coordinate. I was so gratified to hear the Lieutenant General mention uh, the Department of Education, right? I used to get laughed out of the room when I'd be at national security and foreign policy events in here and in Europe uh, saying, okay, we've got a lot of security folks in the room. Where's, where's the Ministry of Culture if we were in another country? Where's the Department of Education? Where's the Department of Health and Human Services? These are all vectors along which our adversaries are certainly targeting us. How are we responding and coordinating with folks that you might not otherwise otherwise see uh, in your day-to-day -day work. Um, this is not a security issue anymore, and we need to get out of that securitized thinking if we're going to meet the moment. We also need to cooperate internationally, and this is somewhere where I think the United States has done a pretty decent job. Uh, we've coordinated with our Five Eyes partners. We've coordinated uh, amongst G7 countries. There's a rapid response mechanism that identifies and responds to disinformation coming from adversarial nations. We did a good job with that with Ukraine. Uh, but there's 
always room for improvement in efficiency, in sharing joint analysis, communications, uh, declassification efforts, which I could talk for an hour on. Those were extremely effective ahead of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, um, and also joint commissions. Now, we've had a huge rollback in the private sector that I would be remiss not to mention. Uh, those of you who are doing research on disinformation, uh, perhaps you noticed, perhaps you didn't, because uh, you haven't been in this field as, as, as long as I have, and I've got some of the gray hairs to prove it. Um, we used to have much more data access to what was going on on platforms for the past eight years. Uh, the platforms became more and more circumspect about that, in part because some people were using that data for ill to target folks in ways that uh, didn't respect their privacy, right? But what we've seen in the past couple of, I would say about a year, is the monetization and complete uh, cutoff of data access for researchers, journalists, etc., to these platforms. Elon Musk is now charging $40,000 a month to access Twitter's application programming interface, or API. This is the way that we communicate with the platform to scrape large amounts of data and uh, analyze what's going on there. Facebook has shut down CrowdTangle, which was the service that we used to analyze data on Facebook. They've replaced it with something called the Meta Content Library, but most researchers agree it is not a suitable replacement. Even Reddit has shut down their API, and Reddit is the front page of the internet. Russia also has launched campaigns on Reddit. Uh, and so we're kind of in the dark about what's going on on social media platforms as we head toward the election. And that's pretty scary. I've done studies uh, over the past couple of years that I would not now be able to replicate because I no longer have access to that data. Uh, this is intentional, right? These people who have multi-billion dollar platforms and are making money off of us, the customers, the users of those platforms, uh, they don't want that scrutiny about what they're doing online anymore. And I think that's a huge problem and that's something for our legislators to solve. Uh, this is a picture of me on my way to testify before the uh, House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Weaponization of Government. So Sophia and James mentioned in my bio that I served briefly as the Executive Director of the Department of Homeland Security's Disinformation Governance Board. This was an entity that was meant to do that coordination that I talked about a couple minutes ago. It was meant to bring together all the disparate parts of DHS, which is a bit of a Frankenstein of a government agency. You've got everything from the Coast Guard, the Secret Service, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, FEMA, uh, Customs and Border Protection, all under one roof. Um, metaphorically speaking, there are actually multiple different buildings. But uh, my job was to bring all of those folks together and say, what are you doing to respond to disinformation in your portfolio? And how can we make sure that we're sharing best practices? How can we make sure that we are keeping the bumpers on the bowling alley of civil rights, civil liberty, and privacy, protecting those rights that we hold so dear as Americans? When this effort was announced, Folks on both sides of the spectrum claimed that it was going to be a ministry of truth and that I was going to be censoring people. Uh, this is pretty laughable because my, my grandfather was actually in a Russian gulag, so I, I'm quite vehemently opposed to censorship. And none of my work had actually focused on anything about removing content. That whack a troll metaphor, I've been using that for eight years, right? I am not in favor of that. I don't think it's effective. Um, but that was the salacious narrative of the day. And as a result, I got death threats. I was pregnant at the time. People were threatening my unborn child. Uh, my, my family was doxxed. My in-laws, my mother received uh, harassment and abuse. And to this day, just yesterday, I got um, a message like that on my phone on the way here uh, from people who, who wish me harm. I bring this up because, not just because this is a cool picture of me, and if you ever have to testify before Congress, I suggest you tip off a photographer so you can get a similar <laughs> picture of you on the way in. Um, but it's because this was the vanguard of, of a wave of attacks against disinformation researchers that continue to this day. Uh, there's an institute out at Stanford, the Stanford Internet Observatory, that had to basically be shut down because of lawsuits and attacks on the people who were doing work there to protect our information environment. There have been extraneous Freedom of Information Act requests at public universities that have buried researchers under paperwork in order to keep them from doing their work. And I'm not the only one, I'm far from the only one who has received these sorts of threats. And so I'm trying to paint a picture for you here that 
the government quite, didn't quite know what to do about this. I ended up resigning because it was clear that they weren't going to defend the work um, and they weren't really defending me and I had a baby on the way and I didn't want to endanger him. Uh, research institutions don't know what to do about this and at the same time we have less access to data than we had before. So the folks who have been the canaries in the coal mine who have been identifying these operations uh, that not only foreign governments but folks domestically are engaging in as well for power and for profit, they are hobbled. I think there is um, a collective commitment to keep doing the work and that's why I, I started my new nonprofit a couple of months ago but it's very, very difficult, um, and it comes at a great expense. And uh, I just want to make sure that everybody knows about that, because I'm not the only one who's been hauled into Congress. I was the first to get a subpoena from that committee. But plenty of us have been dealing with this McCarthyist inquisition over the past two years, and it is endangering our national security to politicize an issue like this at such a critical time. And we also have this advent of artificial intelligence, this accessibility of a new technology um, show, showcased so brilliantly in the opening video of this very conference. But just since January, we have seen, of course, uh, close to home here in Vermont, over in New Hampshire during the primary, the robocall impersonating President Biden that told voters to stay home. We've had uh, deep fake pornography against Taylor Swift, and not only Taylor Swift, I have also been a victim of deep fake pornography, and I always say when I'm speaking to military audiences, this is something that Russia has in its back pocket to undermine the chain of command uh, when you've got female officers who are, uh, you know, in important positions around the world. A great way to destabilize any unit would be to unleash deep fake pornography, and they've done this in countries like Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, shared a deep fake of a Kamala Harris campaign ad, and uh, my friends over at the Center for Countering Digital Hate have found that even though AI companies commit to not allowing their technologies to be used for electioneering, you can generate all sorts of fake images of both candidates that are photorealistic, that are pretty convincing, that might, in a time of, uh, you know, tumult, confuse people and lead them astray. In fact, we just saw this with Hurricane Helene. How many of you saw the AI-generated photo of the little girl and a puppy being evacuated uh, on, uh, yeah, a couple people, right, on a raft? Um, that one wasn't that convincing, in my opinion, but people online are still following for, falling for it, saying, oh, I hope this photo wins the, the Pulitzer Prize. It was generated by AI. So we are in a situation where we've, we've got a technology that doesn't have very many uh, guardrails on it, and uh, if I were Russia, if I were China, if I were Iran, I would be waiting for the next couple of weeks or the crucial transition period between November and January um, when things are kind of uh, tumultuous to unleash something like that and instill doubt and disarray in our democratic system. So this is how I'm feeling right now, uh, less than 30, 30 days before the election. And, you know, I say that in a little bit of a cheeky way. Obviously, I'm still doing this work. I am committed to it. It is gratifying to see so many of you here uh, committed to this work, interested in this work. And I do want to remind you all, as, as we head into the next couple of weeks, um, that we are all on the front lines of the information war, right? This isn't only about what our government can do, and I've outlined some strategies for, for ways that we can improve. There's, there's a lot to be done there. But we all play a role in whether something goes viral or not, right? So think before you share. Uh, this is a diagram from my friend Michael Caulfield at the University of Washington, and it's a really useful mnemonic for the, the things that you should engage in, the practices that you should engage in when you, when you identify a piece of content that you're not sure about online, right? We all know when we get an email from the Nigerian prince offering us a million dollars that that's not real. We need to cultivate that same sort of sentiment and response when we're engaging with content online. So the first thing you do if you feel yourself getting emotional because emotional manipulation is one of the preeminent ways that disinformers uh, push their content, stop. Put your phone down. I know you guys like to say, go touch grass, right? Go touch grass. <laughs> Get outside. Uh, if you're still thinking about that content in a couple of uh, couple minutes, come back inside. Investigate the source. See if they are typically sharing similarly salacious content or divisive content. See if there's other coverage. I don't love that this infographic says better coverage. What's better, what's worse? See if there's other coverage, right? Can you find anybody else reporting on what you're reading? 
And then I know a lot of you are working in open source forensics. Trace those claims. See if you can find the uh, initial instance of that picture of the girl with the dog. Uh, see if it's been misattributed. This is a favorite tactic of Russian disinformers, right? Uh, do a reverse Google image search. See what you can find. This takes less than five minutes. But if we're all engaging in that more um, uh, deliberate engagement with our social media feeds, we can, we can slow the spread of some of these most viral claims that are going, uh, going around in the next couple of weeks. Think about context with AI. Um, there's this thing called the liar's dividend uh, that we've seen, in, <laughs> frankly, in play a couple times already this, this election season, where because, we, because AI has become so accessible, so pervasive, uh, folks that lie frequently can say, oh, that's just AI, or you know, um, my opponent has generated a, an, an AI crowd to make it seem like they are more successful than they actually are. Uh, think about that context. In the case of the robocall with New Hampshire and, and Biden, right? would the president really be telling people not to go out and vote? It seems a little bit far-fetched to me. So think about that context before you're sharing. And then most importantly, support and practice civility. I would expect no less from all of you here at Norwich, but unfortunately some people do forget that there's a human behind the screen. And I, uh, I've experienced a lot of that. One thing that I'll note is that when I, uh, when I do write back, usually to, to older men who have like pictures of their grandchildren in their profile pictures, and I say, hey, you know, my son's the same age as, as your grandson there, and I see you served in Vietnam, so did my dad. Uh, without fail, these folks tend to have pretty bad um, security for their profiles, so I can see all of these things. Um, you know, I find common ground with them, and I say, I'm sorry that, you know, you, you, uh, you've been lied to about my work, but here's, here's what I'm after, and, you know, I'm here to make America stronger, I'm here to make us more resilient, and, and here to protect our democracy, and I find that they do tend to walk things back after that. So just remember that civility uh, during these heady next couple of months, um, and just engage deliberately. I think that's the best thing that any of us can do in an age where we are passively fed so much information. Uh, this is where you can find me online. Uh, those are my two books. I think Sophia and James have read them, so uh, now they're gonna give me some questions. I'm happy to take yours as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. So in How to Lose the Information War, Ms. Jankwitz truly offers an urgent examination of the growing th threat of online disinformation, particularly Russia's campaigns that have destabilized Western democracies. Drawing from her work with Central and Eastern European governments on the front lines of this conflict, you truly shed light on how Western responses have continuously fallen short over the past few years. And the stakes now couldn't be higher. Truth, civil discourse, and the future of democracy are all on the line for us. And uh, we just have one question that we're gonna ask and then we're gonna open up the floor for any cadets or uh, participants to ask a question. But we'd love to dive deeper into your experiences, especially here at Norwich University, as you can look out into the crowd. So many of our students are headed into the government sector. What key lessons from your research on Russia's information tactics should be integrated into military training to prepare all of our officers or those going into the United States government for future conflicts? Yeah, that's a great question. And when I testified before the House Armed Services Committee in 2022, uh, or 2021, I guess, geez, pandemic time, I don't know what year anything was. Um, one of the things that I noted is that we uh, are lucky that you know we've got such a great, uh, strong military, and I've always been so impressed with all the audiences that I've spoken with in, in military audiences. We also have um, a great civilian workforce in DOD, uh, the, the largest uh, government department, and all of those folks, especially those who are deployed, have their families with them too, right? And when you think about this network of individuals that are out there, I think this is a great potential training ground for uh, a broad information li literacy curriculum. This is the sort of thing that DOD does really well. And if I had to say one recommendation for uh, every, um, every enlisted person and every civilian working in a military context, um, it's that we all need basic information literacy training. Uh, you know, it's not only Arlington County, Virginia that doesn't have information literacy in high schools. Um, I think a lot of voting age adults 
do not have the skills necessary to engage with information deliberately. Um, frankly, I, I think I mentioned I teach uh, graduate students at Syracuse. These are smart public policy master's students, some of whom are in mid-career um, and coming back to get a master's. And you know, I, I, one of the assignments I give them, and I encourage you to try it out, is to track your news and information consumption for 24 hours. And they are shocked at the amount of information that just comes to them passively. Scrolling TikTok or Instagram, stuff that is uh, coming through with a news alert. Um, we all need to get better at monitoring that and doing that kind of self-reflection. I think that's the first step. Um, and then when we talk about information literacy, it's not saying this, this outlet is good and this out outlet is bad. It's basic skills like the ones that I just talked about, the SIFT method, that um, allow you to assess a source very quickly, giving folks heuristics for how to do that, um, and, and not overwhelming them and also educating them about the fact that when you're using social media, uh, you, you are the the product, right? That's what's being sold. Your data is being sold. So understanding why when I'm searching for a new pair of shoes, I immediately start getting Instagram ads about those shoes. And then sometimes, unfortunately, I buy those shoes, right? Even I am infallible. Um, but I, I, Even I am fallible in that way. Um, but at least going into it with a little bit more of that context is so, so important. And I think, um, again, the, the DOD structure really offers a way um, for that to go forward. And then beyond that, I mean, the coordination aspect is so, so important. Um, some of you might end up at, at embassies uh, around the world. You know, I encourage you in positions like that or, or working as kind of uh, alongside diplomats, I encourage you to make sure you're reaching out to those folks who, who are the cultural officers and attaches, who are working with the press, um, to get that holistic view of whatever country context or cultural context you're in. Uh, because as we've heard already today, that is so important for understanding your adversary and to developing a response that's not just wholly reactive, but is more proactive. Thank you. We'd like to open up the floor now to any students or audience members who'd like to ask questions. You can step straight up to the mic and we'll signal you when we're ready. You can start on our What's right on? side here. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Sebastian Mejia Lopez. I'm a political science major and studies war and peace. America has a pretty clear stance on uh, free speech and also having basically an informed citizenry through basically means of the tr following the truth. What would you say would be the best approach the United States should follow with regards to let's say our adversaries, clear example being China with how essentially they're uh, using information warfare in terms of having their cybersecurity and censorship interwoven as basically being the same thing. What would you say the United States should essentially do to address these issues? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, um, it deals with one of the stickiest issues of responding to information warfare, which is that uh, Russia especially, but increasingly China and Iran, are playing right on that edge of what is foreign and what is domestic. And of course, we do not want to censor domestic speech. I think the most important thing, and the thing that we've lost, because the platforms have kind of pulled back from cooperation, they've pulled back from data access, is that we don't have oversight and transparency over the social media platforms. If there were one thing that I would hope for Congress to do, it would be increasing that oversight and transparency, not so that somebody in the government can decide what's true or false online, no. But the, so we have a clearinghouse of information and we recognize, okay, here's what's happening on these platforms. We can see, for instance, that uh, there are Russian-backed accounts that are influencing uh, certain parts of the electorate or Chinese, et cetera. We can ask the platforms and see what their response is. What are you doing to protect this election coming up, and they can't just grade their own homework because that's what's happening right now, right? Um, so that oversight and transparency is really important um, to whatever parts of the conversation come next. And there are other countries that have different legislative frameworks for how to deal with this issue. Um, in Europe, the Digital Services Act has just come into play last May. Um, still a bit early to say how that's gonna govern uh, the, the kind of truth and falsehoods online, but what it does do is allow researcher access. And I think that, it, that 
preserves that openness, that free expression that we want to keep, while um, hoping that the platforms are doing their due diligence as these public squares that we now rely on to, to keep us safe from all of that stuff. And frankly, we need more public-private cooperation as well in that way. Um, does that answer your question? More or less. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you for your work on behalf of uh, citizens who value the truth and our democracy. Um, I have a question relating to the social media APIs that you mentioned. So they're being monetized, and I think part of the reason for that is that the content on those APIs is extremely valuable for training large language models. And um, as long as it's free, then large language models can be trained on those that content. Um, but my question is, um, how can we track freedom of speech and hate speech, like different metrics across different social media platforms. How can we track that stuff when the APIs are locked down and what kind of techniques, like technical techniques can be used um, for that? Yeah, um, this is a hard one. So as I mentioned, one of the studies that I did in 2020 is not replicable today, and that one looked particularly at gendered hate speech, abuse, and disinformation against women in politics, used not only by uh, domestic uh, actors, but by Russia, China, and Iran as well. Um, that study, again, I wouldn't be able to do because all of the platforms that we use to gather that data are now unavailable unless I suddenly came into $40,000 a month to, to get access to uh, Elon's API. Um, and I think you're right, by the way. I think you know it's not only um, the AI insights that those, those platforms provide, but they also, uh, frankly, provide um, a lot of data for competitors, and they're not interested in giving that away for free either. Um, so in order to do that stuff today, I think the best way to do it is sampling. Um, and you are still able to get um, small amounts of data. So generally what I've been doing is developing a list of keywords, um, searching across platforms, and then uh, like gathering a thousand posts and assuming that that is gonna be somewhat st statistically significant. It's not the best stand-in. When, um, when we did uh, the, the 2020 study, we gathered 336,000 pieces of data. So that of course was much more robust, um, but we need a legislative solution to that, just like Europe has uh, engineered for, for researchers over there, and I'm hoping we'll see the same thing in the United States um, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. And we're all out of time, but thank you all for attending this insightful panel, and thank you, of course, for inspiring the next generation of leaders right in front of you. If you have any further questions, feel free to come to the front of the stage. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Challenge for you.
Because I know when we sat in on the, uh, the initial meetings of all three of you guys, I was sitting there going, how are we going to put this in 50 yeah, minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Break protocol and, it, and it, that is a challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to write a graduate level oh. information with a foundation course right now. Is it and, for the Norwich? Yeah. I really yeah. want to take that. And I'm struggling because there's so much to put in here. Because this, this, this field is like medicine. It's so broad. And you can contribute in so many different ways, right? Yes, sir. And it's hard to sort of narrow it down to what is, and then and then I get the, the academics to say, you got to have three thoughts in the panel. Like, right. ah. so, you know, when, Good, I mean, she's amazing. When John Kidder told me originally yeah, that they started yeah, making the just, certificate, uh, I was like, oh, and that's, yeah, okay, yeah, that. yeah. So, yeah. She's saying because I I was able to test out really of his classes really actually, really so class. I haven't taken one other than the internships, okay. which got me the credit. For I the wish. Classes. I was surprised. I use their content when I teach the high school. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. And even if I go, excuse but me, like you said, if I go HSI, it's still like just goes to the extension HSI, of it, what you know, we'd like to refer to as patriotism. Because for me, it's all about it's understanding always, why people you know, do what they do, and this is a massive part of it. So. Yep. Yep. Our democracy. I think McCarthyism is a good term for it. Hey, Ross. Are we good? Good morning, distinguished guests, Norwich faculty, and students. Welcome to the 11 o'clock session of the Military Writers Symposium. From virtual footprints to boots on the ground, information warfare and practice. During this panel, we'll hear from three distinguished individuals with experience ranging from hands-on information warfare operations to writing and implementing doctrine. Starting from my left, we have Colonel S Scott Nelson, US Army retired. Colonel Nelson spent 32 years in the Army concluding his career serving as the Director of Academic Engagement for the U United States Cyber Command and Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations, G3 for Army Cyber Command. Colonel Nelson also had, has held executive positions in private security companies. Sitting to the right of Colonel Nelson is Dr. Diane Zori. Dr. Zori is a senior fellow at the Global and National Security Institute at the University of so South Florida, specializing in Gulf politics, U.S. foreign policy, defense strategy, and maritime cybersecurity. Dr. Zori received her PhD in political science from George Mason University, among other degrees. Prior to her career in academia, Dr. Do Dr. Zori excuse me, served as a United States Air Force officer. Seated to her right is Colonel, Colonel Kurt Boyd, US Army retired. Colonel Boyd is currently serving as the Director of Training, Doctrine, and Proponacy at the JFK Special Warfare S Center and School. His career prior to this includes extensive work in our nation's special operations entities. Colonel Boyd's military tenure stretched for 27 years, much of it in psychological operations. Especially notable is that Colonel Boyd is a 1984 alumni of Norwich University. Please give me a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> My name is Isabella Ross and I'm a senior within the Corps of Cadets. My experience in information warfare extends from being an information warfare research intern for the past year and a half with Nuwari, the Nor Norwich University Applied Research Institute. During this time, I've studied many different regions and the impact of adversarial malign influence campaigns. I'll be moderating this session with Cadet Will Bazant. Good morning, my name is Cadet Will Bazant. I'm also a senior in the Corps of Cadets. I'll be commissioning in the Marine Corps this spring, and my experience in information warfare comes through the lens of my experience studying through the Norwich University Peace and War Center abroad and my time working as a police officer in central Vermont. I'm looking forward to enabling a great dialogue this morning. To start the panel off, we have a question for the group and a total of 10 minutes for all answers. The title of this year's Military Writer Symposium is Perception Wars, the Battle Control Reality. In your respective opinion, how do you believe the U.S. is combating the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber domains? And what more does the DOD and universities need to do to provide the U.S. with the best trained professionals? Uh, before we do that, though, I'd like to um, address Colonel Nelson, if you'd like to give an introduction on some of the terms and terminology we could use to better understand this panel. Sure. So thanks very much. Uh, I, I have a very distinguished panel here, and I'm the less distinguished of the, of the group. So uh, it's, it's sort of fun to be back at Norwich University. Um, and I do have a, a freshman at Virginia Tech, don't, don't boo yet, uh, who is in the Corps of Cadets, and he's learning how really short haircuts and a lot of discipline is really challenging. So if you're rooks out there, I understand uh, your first year is frustrating, but it gets better. Um, so, so stick with it. It's, this is a great university to be at. 
Um, so I, I sort of wanted to start the sort of the panel discussion that's really just what uh, the last speaker talked about is sort of definitions of what are we experiencing? What is information warfare? Uh, we, we got a definition of misinformation, disinformation, uh, and propaganda, but really what is information warfare? Um, and and for, for everybody out there, it's really important to understand that information warfare is like one of these, these terms that looks like medicine. So if, if you go back to the late 19, 1800s or 1900s, uh, you know, medicine was trying to evolve as a career field and, and as, a, as a field of prof uh, profession, and it's extremely broad, right? And so just like information warfare, it's an extremely broad field. So if you are a English major, there's a role for you in information warfare, and especially if you're a foreign language uh, uh, major, there's a role for you. If you're studying history, there's a role for you in information warfare because it's such a broad field. Um, and it's, it's one of those fields, I will tell you, and Kurt, Kurt Boyd has had longer experience in the military than I have since being in, in, uh, in 1984. I got him convinced he's 10 years older than me. He really isn't. Um, but uh, uh, it's important to understand that you have a, a place to fit here, and this career field is going to go nowhere but up with the introduction of information uh, or artificial intelligence, synthetic data, and synthetic uh, uh, deep fakes. We're going to start being impacted greatly by this. And if you look at our adversaries, they're all investing in this space, just like what General Parter said earlier, uh, in, a, in a very robust way, because they know where our fractured uh, society is and where our seams are in our government. So, you know, Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Cyber Command, we talk, but not as talk as probably as in coordinate as well as we should. And so they see those fissures and they try to exploit those. And so let's, let's sort of define what information warfare is first. So. Right, right out of the doctrine, there is no defined information warfare uh, definition for, for this in, in DOD. Actually, in Joint Pub 1, it doesn't define what information warfare is. So I, I, I stole something that, uh, that AI actually gave me, uh, because you know AI is always accurate. Um, so information warfare refers to the strategic use of information to gain competitive advantage, often through cyber operations, psychological operations, and electronic warfare. Right? So, now, if you can sort of see that, we, we, we define those into three different specific domains, right? So you've got airspace, land, uh, and then you have cyberspace, and then you have the information environment. So in the information environment, which is in this, in this room here, we have an information environment. We have speakers, we have physical, a physical domain, and the physical domain is the things you can actually see and, and the, where information is transposed. Uh, and then we have, un underneath that, you have the cognitive domain, which is the human beings making decisions about the information they're seeing. And in between the physical and the cognitive is the information domain. It's the way that the mediums and the way the information flows. So we're speaking, so we have a language. It's part of the, the, the medium that's in the, in the uh, information domain. We have electrons on the back screen here, our information domain and images. Oh, those are part of the, the places that we can actually fight this thing uh, called inf the information environment in a, in a place called information warfare. So I just wanted to give that sort of context uh, to understand two major points. One is this thing is actually definable, uh, and, and though whack-a-mole is way, the way we actually engage in the government, unfortunately, right now, uh, there is a way to define this. And so looking at strategic intent of our adversaries, it's very important to understand what is their intent. And if you understand the adversary's intent, then you actually can go after that intent with offensive and defensive means. Um, and so I just wanted to lay that out um, before we got started with the panel to sort of discuss this in a, in a, on a level playing field. Colonel, thank you. We're going to circle back to you at the end for more questions uh, aimed at you. Um, Colonel Boyd, if you could give your answer to our first question. If you'd like me to restate it, I can. The title of this year's Military Writer Symposium is Perception Wars, The Battle to Control Reality. In your respective opinions, how do you believe the U.S. is combating the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber domains? And what more does the DOD and the universities need to do to provide the U.S. with the best trained professionals? Alumni, what then happens to you, and what is the kind of road ahead going to look like? And I'll just sum it up um, with regard to what happened uh, this summer. 
Uh, this summer I had the pleasure of five Norwich interns coming down and participating with us at the Special Warfare Center for what amounted to um, an integration with all the staff at the United States Army Special Operations Command there at Fort Liberty. And, and they, to a person, uh, they, they couldn't have done it better, that the inter integration there was absolutely extraordinary and um, a great deal of um, accolades and so forth. And I want to mention who these people are, just so in the event that you see them around campus, uh, please talk to them, ask them hey, about their experience, and then try to do it again for us this summer. We'd like to see other people come back you know, and engage um, with, with our units um, and do it for real. And then to, to bring it home inside of uh, what is information warfare, um, we had the pleasure of actually embedding um, two of the cadets inside of our 8th Psychological Operations Group, um, which is the group that does um, global dissemination and, of course, touches um, what is this misdisinformation problem. In addition, we had one of the other cadets um, embedded within our regular warfare proponent uh, that we've now assumed responsibility for for the Army. And in, in irregular warfare, the piece that certainly touches the things that we're discussing today um, is counter-threat finance. And, and so this person had the benefit of being embedded um, with the team as they develop training for the remainder of the force and see where this is going uh, for the Department of Defense. So absolutely extraordinary. So the five individuals that participated, the first is just uh, Teresa Antonio, uh, the second is Jonathan Cavaliero, um, <laughs> Kyle Dunn, uh, Lin Lin Linua Lu, and Garrett Mack. Are any of these people here? If they are, please stand up. All right, well, unfortunately, they're not, but have the, if you have the opportunity to run across them um, around campus, please question them on their their activities at Fort Liberty this, this past summer is absolutely exceptional. And then with regard to the question, I'll just keep it brief. I'm not sure that we are um, exact, exactly participating offensively in a manner um, in which uh, the previous speaker, you, uh, Nina, had elaborate, elaborated on in that we need to participate actively in disinformation and we need to not be on the defense, we need to go in the offense. So the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber um, domains, I'll offer, that at least not in a manner in which I think the question assumes. A whole of government, as we already heard, and really a whole of nation is, should be the approach, a unified and common vision of some sort, as well as a common narrative, and I think later on this evening we'll discuss some more of that. Given the roles of our many departments in our government, um, today we'll focus our comments, really my, my comments, strictly on the Department of Defense, and please know that you know, my thoughts do not represent of the Department of Defense itself, these are many of my own personal opinions. All right, please. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, and I spoke to Cadet Cavallaro about his experience this summer, and he said it was inc an incredible opportunity. So, Dr. Zori. Uh, thank you, C Cadet Bazant, for the amazing question, and thank you for the introduction, Cadet Ross. So, the way I look at this is, so for the first question, how do I believe the U.S. is combating adversarial influence? This is a new domain of warfare. And as you know, in the other domains of warfare, we have mastered the art of maneuver. We have not mastered the art of maneuver in this domain. We're still working on it. We're still working on defining what we're doing, coming up with a common lexicon. But some things remain ephemeral offensive and defensive. I would say on the defensive side in this domain, we're doing our job. We're educating cyber practitioners. We are um, you know, correcting mistakes that are online. We are doing attribution. We could probably do more of that. Um, but the enemy does seem to be inside of our OODA loop, and I have you heard of the OODA loop, John Boyd? Observe, orient, decide, act. So the enemy seems to have penetrated this. Now on the offensive side, I will just look at it from the strategic and the tactical. We definitely do things offensively at the tactical level. And so that would be things like deception. Okay, we're not gonna necessarily let our enemy know where we are. We might do a deception campaign to make us seem like we're in a different spot. Okay, especially during a very kinetic conflict. 
All right, you can imagine doing a deception. The boat, the, the ship is here, or is it here, or is it somewhere else? We're doing this pretty good. Now, at the strategic level, I would argue we are not doing a good job. And it's mainly because disinformation at the strategic level counters US values, okay? So what's the best thing we can do at the strategic level, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit more later, is to tell the truth, to completely tell the truth, all right? Now to the second point in the question, what does the DOD um, and what do universities need to do more in this space? Well, I would argue, um, you know, there will be thought leaders, and Norwich is definitely a thought leader in this space in terms of coming up with a curriculum to educate. Um, you're going to see, I think, across um, the educational enterprise um, within the United States, more focus on public, uh, uh, more focus on, I'm sorry, critical thinking. So I'm already seeing that in some places in the United States at public schools is this focus on critical thinking, teaching people how to think critically. Um, beyond that, I think it's really difficult to do things um, as a whole of government, not to say it's impossible, but our country is really big. And so there's countries that do this really, really well, and we've done some things to model what they're doing in our country, but I think it's gonna take place more at the state and local government level, is to you know, educate uh, people on how to, to see through some of these nefarious, uh, deceptive tactics that are being used against us in our, uh, in our democracy. So, so I'm gonna go sort of focus more on the, on the university piece and really sort of think about a roadmap uh, that Norwich could use, and you're already doing a lot of this. So, we, you know, we started talking about the definition of, of, of information warfare. We have cyber operations. You have programs in cyber operations. You have programs in cyber defense, cyber security. Uh, and now you're launching programs in artificial intelligence. Uh, deep fakes and, and uh, synthetic uh, media is gonna be another important place to look. And then the, the whole idea of quantum computing is gonna be important as we look at the future. And that, and that really gets into the, this idea of, uh, of the physical dimension of cyberspace uh, and how do, how do you map that out. The, the next thing is uh, you need to start looking at programs, especially in your social sciences programs, right? So anthropology, uh, sociology, economics, uh, and political science all fit very well into this space. And one of the things that I've seen, and, and you've heard the panelists all talk about it, is this is an ill-defined place, especially in the Department of Defense. Uh, we found the term mis- and disinformation so challenging politically that we, we come up with our own term, which is foreign malign influence. And we focus, because of our title uh, authorizations, only Title 10 and Title 50, we can focus only on foreign threats. So hence, foreign malign influence makes sense. But if you start thinking about foreign malign influence and defining that, how, how do you go back to this definitional aspect of it and look at your curriculum and your, and your programs that can exist in how we break down those threat actors and how they operate. So, so Kurt talked about threat finance as an example, right? So uh, most of the speakers have talked about, well, how do, how do these organizations in these other countries actually operate? Finance is a big part of that. So if we look at how we took down the terrorist organizations during Operation Iraqi Freedom and, and Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, we, we hit them hard with the, cutting off their finances, right? So we understood how they were using the internet to finance their operations, and we targeted those things. How do we do the same thing for the foreign malign influence threats that we face in our country? Uh, we actually have to actually understand our adversary, and I don't think we do very well. Uh, we don't understand the Russia uh, connection between the GRU and the FSB, and how this foreign malign influence actually functions, how they use the Russian business networks to operate against us so they have some sort of attribution uh, uh, obfuscation when it comes to how they actually execute uh, influence in our country. They understand us better than we understand them in a lot of ways. The Chinese are, are an emerging threat. Their, their focus right now is economic for the most part, but if you look at their three, three wars doctrine, they certainly have sp psychological operations and they see the United States through their lens of Desert Storm and the, and the fall of, uh, of the Berlin Wall and their experience with Tiananmen Square in 1989 through this idea of a foreign actor influencing their country, and that's a big threat to our centralized authoritarian government. And so we have to sort of see the lens to our adversaries, 
uh, and, and the way they view the world to be able to go to counteract these things. And then we have to be offensive. So we can't just do the whack-a-mole idea uh, of just countering somebody's speech in, on the internet. We have to actually go after the infrastructure, as we talked about, the information environment that exists, the physical aspects of how they actually operate to put in, mis and disinformation into our sphere of influence. Uh, how do we target that from a physical perspective? So that's offensive cyber operations, that's threat finance. Uh, that's actually going after the physical individuals that are doing this stuff or con commanding controlling that. Uh, and then we need to look at the information itself. How do we target that? So that means going after the server farms, going after the AI networks they're using, et cetera. And then finally, how do we then create a re resiliency in our country, as Diane talked about, in, in, in this idea of resilience and critical thinking of, of our individual uh, uh, Americans as well as, as our military members, right? So we, the United States military, need to realize that we're actually a massive threat here uh, when it comes to foreign line influence, targeting just what General Potter said, if you're using um, you know, uh, foreign line influence against our, our female senior officers that are leading organizations uh, and using synthetic data to do things against them, it's rumors are, are a massive way to target uh, the, the, the credibility of, of a person, and if you take down the command and control, you have a massive impact on the morale of that organization. So these are all things that we need to think about from an offensive, defensive perspective that we don't do that today. And unfortunately, I've been in this space for 25 years. Kurt has been in a little longer than me. Uh, but we've always had to fight an upward battle with, with credibility in this information warfare, this, this war fighting domain that we're in. Uh, and we're not, we're not really getting the level of resources or focus uh, that an F-22 or an F-35 or an Abrams tank has or whatever else, drone technology, cyber, even cyber today is billions of dollars of investment. And I will tell you our formal line influence investment is going down and the priorities already been taken off in the Army side uh, for, for USASOC to do what their, what their mission is. So, you know, where are the priorities and is this really a problem from our leaders' perspective that our leaders see. And, and I, can, I can have a lot of very strong opinions with general officers out there uh, that I don't think the way that we educate them uh, to understand this space is, is what it needs to be. It needs to get much stronger and better. They need to see it for what it is. Uh, and it can't be just going into a war zone all of a sudden, hey, this is a big problem. And they come back to the United States, oh, it's not a big problem anymore. I, want, I need to invest in modernization. We need, to, we need to understand that this problem is global and it's impacting us constantly. Sir, thank you. Colonel Boyd, uh, this next question is more oriented towards uh, the title of our uh, seminar today and takes a little bit of stage setting. In May of this year, U.S. Green Berets in Sweden conducted a mock raid and intelligence gathering mission on a building. What was notable about the raid was the inclusion of organic cyber warfare capabilities at the team level. An ODA, or operational detachment, in the vicinity of the objective forcibly entered the Wi-Fi network and exploited it by unlocking doors and manipulating CCTV cameras, thus enabling the entry team to complete their mission with ease. Cyberspace is a complex environment and requires extensive training to dominate. Is it realistic or desirable to make every combat armed service member a cyber expert in addition to the extensive training they already go through? All right, I'm gonna break this down into a few pieces. Before I start though, let me comment uh, briefly on the, the notion of doctrine. Um, so that people don't start with an aversion to it, because um, more often than not, uh, people, when they say that, then the next thing they say is, do we really have to read it, and do we have to learn it? And, and the answer is absolutely yes. And in my current, I guess, position, my, my task is, of course, to make it more consumable, to bring it into the 21st century, and to give it to future operators with a capacity to to be able to communicate more effectively. And, and that's internally, right? And of course, externally, people can read our doctrine and learn about what we do. But to know and understand on the surface of what it is, it is a description of the force. So currently, the Army today has Field Manual 3-0, um, which is referred to as operations, and that is their capstone doctrine for how to conduct multi-domain operations. The future of Army warfare involves air, land, sea, space, cyber, and information, and so on. And, and then there is similarly uh, dimensions that nest under that, uh, which are critically important to you, that some of you have already begun discussing and we're discussing today, and the notion of the information, human, and physical dimensions. 
And the Army essentially created this book um, so that it can change the future of the Army um, and for one, one very important reason, uh, that over the course of the last 20 years, it participated in the global war on terror and it retooled itself to be effective at conducting counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. When it now looks to the future, what does it see? It sees the capacity to continue to do those, right, at small scale, but understands that the true threat is much more daunting and large. And so they coined the term large-scale combat operations. You can expect to hear more about multi-domain operations in the future uh, because the Army also has recognized that it doesn't go to war by itself. It goes to war as a joint force. It's inherently joint, much like SOF has always been, and so therefore it will communicate that way in the future. And that's very good um, for the information component uh, because also the Army recognizes that central to operations is the notion of information. And they actually invested over the course of the last number of years the development of their own doctrine in that regard, which is publication 313, um, Information Advantage, which is what you, you stated. Um, so it, with that, so that you just kind of understand kind of what the, the background is to all this, and the notion of what Diane had mentioned with regard to maneuver is absolutely true. General Potter mentioned it, that with regard to the information space, you can certainly help me, help us in the future if you're thinking in that, that way, right? That it's not just in the physical space that we conduct maneuver, it is also in the information space, and they both play off one another, all right? And then with regard to this particular question, of course, I asked immediately, can I really comment on this? Um, this is 10th Special Forces Group. Do you know why it's 10th Special Forces Group? Anybody? Why was it created? It was created in 52 because we had a peer competitor that was concerned about what special operations forces might do. And it, the 10th group was created. Why? Is there nine other groups? No, right? So what did that tell you, right? So it offered at least a little bit of a question in people's minds as to what the potential is for the United States military and the use of special operations to conduct various operations, both inside and outside of combat. So I unpack this question into four pieces, and I'll, eat, I'll hit each, um, just one after the other, if that's all right. Um, so the notion of having a working knowledge of space. So what I'll offer there is um, the other task that I have at the Special Warfare Center and School is training. So all things training in the institution, making Green Berets, psychological operations, and civil affairs soldiers uh, for the Army. But we do it at various levels. And at the various levels in which we teach it, initial entry being one, in some respects like you here in an academic institution, and the things that you need to do to matriculate through and acquire your degree. Same, same as to acquire a military occupational specialty or a branch. And so we have that branch training um, for SF, Civil Affairs, and PSYOP. And then likewise, on top of that, we have professional military education which is layered in on top of the, the initial entry training to train leaders. So Army-wise, they have what is called office, officer education system, and on the NCO side, they have the NCO education system. Both of those are um, really uh, process-driven. It's aligned to where we create um, a certain level of curriculum, even in the civilian sector, so the notion of having training and education outlines or outcomes, uh, those exist as well as a certain curriculum that gets accredited uh, by our own institution and, uh, and others included. And then similarly, e each level of our education and training, we also seek academic and industry credential. So in most of the training that we conduct at the Special Warfare Center and School can be aligned with certain academic credentialing and then similarly um, with civilian credentialing. I'll mention that as background to the next comment. And so the comment on the notion of space. So currently the Army is doing a, a total review of where it is in its training. And why is this? Because as I said, 20 years of the global war on terror, some of those skills and abilities the Army has lost, right? The ability to navigate through the woods using a compass. Wow, what an idea. Well, when you went to Iraq and Afghanistan, eh, you know, it wasn't so wooded wasn't really a big problem, right? And so, therefore, and, and you had, what? Devices, 
And what did we do in Iraq and Afghanistan? We eliminated much of the communications architecture, so we owned most of it. So it wasn't a real issue. So the, so the bottom line is today, you know, we're getting back to basics. The whole idea within the special operations community is absolutely must be brilliant at the basics, no question. And then we move from there. So what does, what does that have to do then with the introduction of space? You can't do global communications without it, right? And so therefore, if space or the Navy or the Air Force wants to be expeditionary, they got to be touching space, right? And so therefore, our people at the tactical level will have some knowledge of it. The degree in which they're manipulating it, you know, we're not going to publish that, you know, so that you, we can talk about it in this auditorium. But, but the bottom line is that space is ubiquitous and, and we need to incorporate it basically from the ground up. And we need to understand from the operator back why that's essential. Because in the past, right, we have had a difficult time pushing information to the edge, right, where it ne it's, it's absolutely needed. So therefore, the, the, essentially the intelligence picture is made available, right, to the lowest common denominator as, as it comes available. So that's, that's my comment with regard to space and where it should end up. And then can we introduce cyber at the tactical level as it relates to an operational detachment alpha? Um, within special forces, there's a 12-person detachment. It's led by a, a captain. Um, he is the detachment commander. He has an ops warrant, um, also helping him with the leadership of that, that detachment. And then there's 12 NCOs. Those 12 NCOs are made up of communications, engineering, medical, and weapons expertise. Um, within that structure, um, they also, of course, acquire all the latest and advanced techniques and te technologies that are being made available. You can imagine, you know, today with regard to robotics and unmanned systems, is there a need? And of course there is. Is there a need that's actually happening, you know, within the maneuver center? And are they doing things with regards to that? Absolutely. So we're all sharing in, in the advancements of those technologies. However, to create what is cyber expertise and put it on an ODA and make it organic, that's a whole different question. As I said, initial entry training and then professional military education, that, that we do for those particular skills. The cyber training occurs at the cyber center, right? Their center of excellence. And, and we don't need to get into that as far as um, who's crossing streams. The task currently is theirs. And if we need that requirement within special forces or within civil affairs or psychological operations, we task organize. Every commander has the, the flexibility to do that and we actually ex execute it again at the lowest level. Give people what they affectionately call bolt-ons. So if you want to have an image, you know, it's like Legos. We're going to stick, you know, other skill sets and make them available to a particular team, right, so they can execute various missions in a, in a particular environment. The other thing to pay, take note of, the globe, right, while we all want to make it, you know, a hub just one kind of thing, one size fits all, it's not that way, right? We have regionalized these special forces capabilities and, and apply those particular technologies uniquely to those regions because they are not all the same. And so we have to address that. Two other pieces and then I'll get off the mic here. Um, the training pipeline, there was a comment in this about the length. The other thing that people get concerned with is, oh, it takes forever to train these guys. Uh, the truth of the matter is it takes a year, right? That's one time through. How many people make it one time through? Very few. Right? Why is that? Because it's hard. And why is it hard? Because it has to be because the reliance on these folks is that they can perform their skills without access right, to a great deal of support. Right? They're out there on the edge. The whole idea of, you know, read the books, behind enemy lines, that's who you can expect to be there. And so we need to ensure that they have the, the appropriate mental aptitude as well as the physical and then, of course, the skill. And that's what we deliver and, and provide to them through a years long training. Now, they recycle and come back through and are they successful? Most of them are, absolutely, because why? Because we're supposed to train them. They've already been selected, they're gonna go through the training, it's our task to train them. So that's, that's, that's how we deal with it. So the other thing about that is at the center in school, the people get all kind of enamored with the notion of, hey, I can do this halo, high, high altitude jumping, I can do dive school, I can do all these advanced skills, certainly. But you need to get proficient at the basic skills first, be assigned to a unit, and come back to us, and then, then you have the benefit of going through those specialized schools. And the last point, um, 
And then the, the thing that I'll also make, make, you, you know, make you aware of is um, within the community itself, the other, other aspect of where SOF has been over the years is, is SOF has found itself um, independently co conducting various operations um, in a way that the Army is unaware. So the expectation is now that particularly with an Army SOF, that we will be nested with the Army and out there and conducting operations with them so that they can benefit right from the abilities of special operations more so than they have done in the past. The historical record is not good um, with regard to where special operations sits post-conflict, um, and so therefore in order to repair that, uh, we need to bind ourselves with the Army, and that's where we're head with our, headed with our own doctrine. Thank you. Sir, thank you. Dr. Zori, if you could take five minutes and answer the following question, uh, which I find especially interesting because earlier you spoke about how the U.S. competing at the strategic level in this field is actually immoral in some ways. Um, so I ask you this. Depending on their cognitive frame of mind, the, the average American might view the U.S. government today and throughout the late 20th century as either a reckless violator of the international order, an example being the post-9-11 CIA torture program, or, to the contrary, an enforcer of the rules-based global order, um, the liberation of Kuwait being an example. In this breath, do you believe the U.S. government is too hesitant in our employment of irregular and information warfare, warfare? And if so, what solutions might you offer? That is a fantastic question. So I would posit that the enemy is inside our OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, and we are observing this and we are orienting to the threat, but we have not yet decided on what to do and how to act. So who is the enemy? Okay, I would posit that we've got four, four big ones. You've got Russia and China and Iran and North Korea. Those are our big four. Uh, what do we do about this? Okay. They've, they've jumped in, they're on the offensive, at the strategic level, inside this domain. And we're not sure what to do. So I would, I would go back to the basics. What does Sun Tzu say? <laughs> he says, know your enemy and know yourself. All right? So how well do we know Korean, Chinese, Russian, Persian, Farsi, Urdu? Do we, know, do, do we understand these cultures? I would venture to say that in all of these places, there's many more people that speak English than there are people that speak Chinese or Russian here. They know us. They know our social cleavages. They might know us in some ways better than, they, than we know ourselves because they're very objective about it. They're not American. Um, you know, I, I would say, what do we do about it? Um, and America, I think, is growing in this space. And I had the unique privilege, uh, maybe it was fortune or misfortune, to live in a country for the past two years. I recently moved. I would call it a light authoritarian country. But even in a very light authoritarian country, you see things like the total censorship of any information that counters that country's regime. You see the total censorship of reality, okay? I lived in a country where they constantly told us there was no crime, none, zero, okay? Now, is that humanly possible? Everything was censored. We had a major flood, all right? And it was devastating to the country, but nobody died. Nobody, nobody was hurt. Everything was fine, okay? It was not fine. It was not fine at all. So I would say, you should be very proud, and, and sometimes you have to step out of your country or your framework or your bubble to, to see it. And I know my, my kids learned a lot from this experience, maybe even more than I did, is we're very lucky to be Americans, and we should be very proud of that, all right? We are a free and democratic country, but know yourself, all right? There was this movie that came out in 2002, and you've you're probably gonna laugh when I tell you what it is. Maybe you've seen it. It was called Eight Mile. And it was about a famous rapper named Eminem. Now, I really like this movie because at the end he gets in a rap battle with someone who was very good, but he, he, he won that rap battle. How did he win the rap battle? He won it by being very, very true to who he was and admitting everything about himself. 
So much so that his opponent really couldn't say anything. Okay, so if we are really going to be honest in this new era of information, we need to be honest about who we are. Because the world knows, and at the end of the day, we know as well. We know how America was founded. We know our dirty laundry. We know all of it. But we also know that we are a great country that's working to become a more perfect union. We're not perfect. We're not an authoritarian country that's pretending to be perfect or that's putting up a Potemkin village. We know that we have dirty laundry. We know we have things that we need to work on. And the enemy gets inside those cleavages and tries to divide us. But I think by being completely truthful, the truth will always come out, okay? But by completely owning the good, the bad, and the ugly, that's how we can go forward in this new era, this new information era. Thank you very much, Doctor. Colonel Nelson, our final, our final questions are directed at you, um, and we have two of them. First, based on your extensive experience with information warfare and cyber, how do you predict adversarial influence will develop, and how will it change the way that military and strategic planners view the world? Um, and secondly, based on your military and academic experience, how would you recommend students and adults alike begin to educate themselves on IW and adversarial influence operations outside of Norwich University's information warfare minor? Are there certain topics we should give more time to studying? So, so I'll start with the first one, um, and I'll make it relatively simple. I think it's just going to be more robust. There will be a lot more velocity, so it will be coming at us at a rap more rapid speed. Uh, they'll know a lot more about us. Uh, artificial intelligence is a, is a game changer. Uh, it is the new internet, and that's just a fact. Uh, it's a technology that's going to modernize uh, the way we look and how we act amongst each other. Uh, you won't be able to tell the difference between a synthetic uh, voice on a phone and an artificial intelligence, right, or, na or a, a natural one. So, so that's going to cause significant changes. The great thing about our country, again, is, is, is uh, Diane said, is we're a robust entrepreneur country, so we can come up with defenses to a lot of this, right? We, we're de we are the, 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 the world leaders, regardless of what the Chinese tell you, in, in artificial intelligence. Uh, we have private industry doing that, and it's a global effort. Uh, it's not just the United States doing it. It's, it's meta, uh, 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 open, open AI, um, I forgot the other two. Well, I've talked to all four of them here recently, and they're all like asking for the government to actually help them with a lot of this development, which is a good sign um, uh, versus what, you know, what we've heard about some of the, uh, the social media companies. Um, but I think what you're going to start seeing is we rapidly uh, evol ev evolution of, of information warfare against our country, especially understanding uh, the, the risks and the, the fissures we have in our society and then trying to drive wedges into those. The challenge our government will have is because we, we always say whole of government, whole of society, but we have a very hard time doing that unless we have a massive crisis, like 9-11 was an example, right? So we had a very unpopular president. If you remember, President Bush, prior to September 11, 2001, was a very unpopular president. He had just won a very controversial election. Uh, and all of a sudden, his approval rating was over 80% after 9-11, right? And it stuck with him for about a year. Uh, his father, the same, with Desert Storm, right? He went from very poor approval ratings up to over 80%, and then he, he, he lost the next election. So, so it's a demonstration of our country is actually relatively resilient if we come together, uh, but we got to sort of force that com come together in this. And our, our government is a very conservative place for the most part. And when I say conservative, I don't mean this in the sense of a political orientation. I mean in the sense of change. So, so we have to figure out how do we robust the ability to, to embrace change in our, in our uh, departments and our agencies. Just, just to give you an example, what Kurt just talked about with ODAs, and we've had that discussion about how do we enhance ODAs on the tactical environment, especially in the, in the Pacific theater, when you're doing a lot of operations, isolated operations in, in island chains, right? Um, you don't have ma massive armored uh, formations that can come to rescue of an ODA. So they have to figure out how do they, pl they pluck things from other functional commands, like cyber or space, to enable those ODAs to function. And we got to do a better job of communicating that and, 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 and working together as an army 
uh, let alone as a joint force and at other, other agencies like DHS, et cetera, and working those together. We're still sort of fractured when it comes to stove piping of our government. We gotta, we gotta figure out how we sort of le level that out. And then this needs to be a defined problem in government uh, and, and sort, sort of set everybody's strategic directive on how we're gonna solve the problem. Not a really great answer to a very complex problem, but and really more complicated problem because of our politics. Uh, but but it's the best uh, that we can work on right now, and you guys are going to be the forefront of this. And as you as you escape from Norwich University uh, in in four years or one year and join the military or join other organizations, you're going to face this problem in spades uh, coming forward. The second thing about education. Uh, I think from, from a Norwich perspective, you are on the cusp of something great. Uh, honestly, you're a small university, you're, you're actually very robust in the way you look at the problems and opportunities. You, you can't, you're just not gonna compete with a Harvard with an endowment of billions of dollars. Uh, but what you do have is you have intellectual capacity in this institution to can think differently about a problem. Nobody that I've seen, I've seen very few panels uh, in DOD working with the universities that are talking about information warfare uh, and procession management. Um, there, there's some of it going on, but I don't see a lot of that going on and engaging the Department of Defense. Um, we need to do more of that. We need to make more of our, our leadership here at Norwich talking to you. We need to, we need to grow this into the senior military colleges so all six universities are working together with the Corps of Cadets because all six universities fill 14% of the commissioned officers across the joint force. So there's a pretty significant impact that this school and the, and the five other senior military colleges can have when it comes to influence the future uh, of, the, of the US military. The other thing I would think about is, as, as Kurt talked about the ODA challenge, how do we start getting our, in ROTC, our leaders to start talking about information warfare and do we, do we create an FTX for information warfare? Right, so you do, you do FTXs now when you go out there and maneuver in the, and, and understand maneuver warfare. Do we need to understand maneuver warfare in the information environment? Do we create that tactical level team so that team goes into that, uh, you know, a war fighting exercise, you know, and it can be a small space and you're, you're living the worst uh, day of your life when it comes to a military uh, engagement, but it's all around information inf the, and information warfare. And, and it doesn't have to be, all experts in that field. It's, it's great to bring the infantry guys, infantry officer, you know, we're not the smartest people in the world. Um, uh, the chemical officers, the, the communications officers, bring them in as a team and have them have to fight together to understand why this is such a hard space and, and figure out innovative solutions to do that. And those then become case studies that you use inside the classroom. Um, the final one is, I, I just want to sort of emphasize something else, and, and again, going back to the cutting age, uh, edge of, of Norwich University, uh, you guys are founding members of the, the National Center for Narrative Intelligence. Um, that just stood up here in August of, of 2023. Uh, it just got funded for con by Congress uh, for FY24, and we have an additional uh, funds coming in for 25 and beyond. The DOD CIO has taken over leadership role of that, and so you look at this and go, DOD CIO, what the heck do they care about influence? They're seeing the, the, the impact on their organization when they start talking about networks and networks of viability the influence piece is becoming critically important because of the social engineering and the, the impact that AI is having now with uh, in, impacting the, 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 the human capital that exists in the organization. So the easiest target, if you, if, if you t take any cybersecurity courses, the easiest target is not the seven layers of the, of the information system, it's the eighth layer, or the, I don't know if it's eighth or seventh layer, is the human being, right? And so 80% of the cyber attacks that happen, I just had one today, uh, which is a, you know, a, my gas company tell me I owe more money. I don't owe you any more money, and it, just, it was a phishing attack trying to get me to call a number and put more money into, them, into their account. Um, and so, so we have to really start putting all our students into this uh, crucible of, of the information environment. Uh, and you sort of live that on a day-to-day -day basis, but how do we start doing that in the classroom in a, in a more structured perspective? And then the last piece is, is understanding, as I talked about before, how do we understand that this, this field is like medicine? It's very, very broad. And everybody has a place to fit, the historians to the, to, to the AI professionals that are developing the next learning model. All of those fit into this space. Even the psychology majors out there uh, play in the ethics of developing AI. Very important aspect of how we look at AI in the future, right? So do we want, we want terminators or something that's actually helpful to us, right? 
Uh, and so we, we got to think about that. And, and no, our adversaries are looking at terminators um, because that is a, a level playing field. You know, we don't have to use human, human beings. We use machines to, part, to fight the future wars. Um, so, so those are the things I look at the university. I think the university has some pr pretty good vision of where we need to go. Um, but I would, I, would, I would ask you to really pub publicize the things you're doing here in a, a more grandiose way uh, and, and bring more leaders like General Potter to come down and look at what they're doing and, and actually give her a briefing on here's the university's perspective on information warfare and how we're doing things in this curriculum. Thanks. Sir, thank you. Um, I, I agree that I, I think Norwich also is, is well stanced to have a bit, bigger effect on the industry in the future, uh, which is exciting, although I won't see it as a student here. Um, I apologize that we have no time for questions, but as we wrap up this panel, we would like to give thanks to our panelists for coming to campus today to share their insights on the importance of information warfare uh, for all realms of warfighters. Uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. Uh, we'll now break for lunch from 12 to 1300. Uh, the next program will be here in Mac Auditorium at 1300, titled Russian Information Warfare, The Battle to Control Reality. Everyone's Thank hungry. you all for your attendance. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> we might have a couple come to the front and ask questions. So that'll be That's fine. fine. Yeah. I'll stand by.